Hello and good evening everyone. And because Easter's coming up, I thought it would be good to choose a topic to discuss that was, you know, relevant to Easter and what's more relevant to Easter than the resurrection or specifically the argument from the historical evidence to the resurrection of Jesus. And I thought an interesting video to look at would be the debate between Trent Horn and um, Pine Creek, Dog Pine Creek, which was hosted by Digital Gnosis, also Nathan, um, uh, I don't know, a few weeks, a few months ago. So what I wanted to do here is respond to Trent's arguments as presented in that debate. I think Doug did a good job, uh, but as I discussed with him in, I guess it was Nathan's stream subsequently to that, um, Doug has his own approach. I have a different approach, so I think it's useful to present different approaches. Um, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom or whatever the saying is. And so here I'm going to present kind of my approach to these sorts of arguments um, using basically Trent's presentation in uh, his debate with Nathan as a kind of a springboard to discuss some of these ideas and present how I think about it. Um, I think that these this debate is sort of a bit... Uh, interminable. I mean, it's been going on for centuries and it's unlikely to be settled anytime soon, but hopefully we can uh, gain a bit, a bit of a better insight and clarity about some of the structure of the argument, some of the evidence that's available, and uh, particularly from a naturalistic perspective, um, share some of the reasons why I don't think that the historical evidence for the resurrection uh, of Jesus is, is very convincing. In fact, I think it's quite weak. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, and I'm not going to be, as I sort of said, I'm not going to be playing Doug's portions. I'm just going to be playing Trent's portions, um, at least up to the first rebuttal and maybe a little bit of the discussion. We'll see how we go and uh, and responding to those. All right, so let's play here. Everyone, we're debating a question. Did Jesus rise from the dead? This, mean, Doug, this means that Doug has the burden to show the answer is no, not just I don't know, and I need to show the answer is yes. To proceed, let's follow this principle. Things are as they appear unless evidence suggests otherwise. This keeps us from being irrational skeptics and from believing anything just because we want it to be true. So does Doug have any good reasons to say Jesus? Yeah, so so when um, Trent says Doug here, I'm going to take that as referring to just the the, the skeptic, broadly, broadly speaking. Um, now, this principle here, I, I don't know that it's really that important for Trent to establish this, but I, I think it's bears comment that this principle of, um, I think it's sometimes referred to as phenomenal conservatism or something to that effect, which is that things are... Uh, typically as they appear, unless there's good reason uh, to think otherwise. Um, let me get the exact wording of that, just so that I'm not strawmanning it all here. Well, things are as they appear, unless evidence suggests otherwise. Yeah, so I actually said things are as they appear, not even just that it's reasonable to think they are. Um, yeah, I think this is nonsense. Um, I don't really know. I mean, I, I guess I need to do a bit more reading into the philosophical underpinning of this, uh, of this position here. But just um, for the moment, I'll say that I don't think there's any good reason to accept this principle. And also, I think that there's good reason to deny this principle. I think most of the time, things are actually not as they appear, depending on what you mean by that. So um, let me put it this way. The way things appear to us uh, is highly contingent on uh, sociocultural factors, how we're brought up, the way we see the world, the worldviews and models that we form in our mind and what we were taught as children and, and the worldview we have and all of this sort of stuff. Um, it's not really clear why we would expect reality to correspond to that unless we have further evidence that it does beyond simply that that's the way that it sort of uh, impinges itself on us so you know if i go outside and i see that there's um i don't know what's a good example of this if i go outside and i see something that looks like a tree i'm like oh that's probably a tree um now if that's a species of tree that i've seen many times before and i kind of know that it's i don't know it's a gum tree or it's a maple tree or whatever then well yeah i'm going to be right about that but actually, like the ordinary person like myself is really bad at distinguishing trees from things that look like trees. For centuries, people thought fungi were a species of plant or a type of plant because they didn't really understand the difference between uh, between uh, fungi and, and plants, right? Um, there are types of herbs and shrubs and, and vines and all sorts of other um, types of vegetation that look like trees are actually not trees, right, according to the technical classification. I'm using the example of tree because it's a sort of a simple everyday object, right, to, to try to make it a bit more concrete without even adverting to very complicated um, or um, non-observable stuff like quantum mechanics or whatever. But but even with sort of simple everyday things, um, very often if you're just shown random sort of pieces of vegetation, you're asked, like, what is this? And you think it's a tree or you, you think it's a flower or whatever. You, you, like, you're probably going to be wrong about that unless you have specialist knowledge. Um, here's another example. So people often think that we have pretty pr uh, privileged access to our own psychological states. Uh, 
And some of those, uh, to some extent, that might be true for things like pain. But I mean, even there, there's some issues. But when we're talking about um, things like insight into our our own motivations, like reasons why we do things, uh, there's ample evidence from cognitive psychology to indicate that often we don't actually have insight into why we do things. That we do things for reasons that are not that are often not uh, transparent to us, and that when um, when this can be controlled in you know laboratory uh, environments, what you often find is people confabulating reasons that are demonstrably not the reasons why they did something. Um, and there are many biases that um, we are subject to that mean that, in fact, often we don't have very good insight into why we do things or our, our real motivations. Uh, not to mention memory distortions as well that mean that we're reflecting on the past, we're also often inaccurate in reporting things. So, I mean, you know, this is just from psychology and from perception of sort of everyday objects. One could go down the list here, but pretty much in every area of human endeavor, there seem to be very strong reasons to think that things aren't as they sort of naively appear. Again, this is prior to bringing a sort of a scientific skeptical evidential basis uh, to things. Obviously, I think that we can gain an understanding of things at least an approximate understanding of things as they are uh, but but that's not really the claim here the claim is that things are as they seem unless there's good reason to think otherwise i, I think that um in fact that's a very that's a very gull gullible and naive approach right so this is what this is what magicians and other confidence tricksters uh, uh, rely on is that people just sort of having this naive assumption that things are as they appear or at least turning off their critical apparatus um yeah i would say that i would say that unless you have uh, like a lot of experience with a specific type of um, context or domain and a lot of um, knowledge to bring to bear on that, that you should actually be quite skeptical that things are as they appear there because probably you don't have you don't have sufficient familiarity with or knowledge of the relevant factors to make that assessment. Um, so if you see something that's highly out of the ordinary and just sort of assume, well, it's probably as it appears to be, uh, I think that it's actually quite likely you're going to be wrong about that. Uh, UFO sightings are a good example of this. When people see things in the sky that they're probably not used to looking up at the night sky at bright or strangely moving objects and identifying what they are, people very frequently mis uh, misattribute what, uh, what, what they're looking at. Uh, the most commonly misidentified like the, the most commonly cited unidentified flying object from what I understand it is the moon. Now you'd think people would know how to recognize the moon, but apparently in many contexts, you know, because it, uh, it moves in position and it changes apparent size depending on, um, depending on the orbits of the earth and the moon and it can change brightness and there's clouds and there's strange weather conditions. And there's the fact that it changes apparent shape as well because of, you know, the, the waxing and the waning moon and all these other factors mean that people can misidentify it. So, so, so the point is, the way something appears to us is not just a given, it is um, it is shaped by our prior background knowledge. And often that's lacking and incomplete or, or biased. And so the way something appears to us is not just some sort of um, atheoretic uh, given. Um, it's, it's deeply theory dependent and often dependent on just folk beliefs that don't have a lot of justification. Um, unless it's something, again, that we are intimately familiar with and have a lot of practice with. Um, so particularly here when... You know, so if I walk down the street uh, under normal conditions, you know, on a sunny day, blah, 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 and I see someone I recognize. Yeah, OK, I, I can take it. It's reasonable to infer that it is, in fact, that person, because I do have good familiarity with those type of conditions, recognizing people that I know under, um, you know, normal conditions and normal circumstances. So even there, I can be mistaken. Uh, but generally, we, we can do that. Right. But whenever it moves out, strays outside of the areas that we do have that um, that experience in and that um that sort of proven competence in, such as identifying objects in the sky at night or identifying species of plants or apparent plants that we haven't seen before or um, appearances of apparently miraculous or supernormal events, right, which is obviously relevant here. Anytime we push outside those boundaries, we should be extremely skeptical about uh, just, just sort of believing what we sort of intuitively think is the case. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I just don't really, I just don't really buy this as a um as a supposition here i don't know that trent needs this for his case um i guess the fact that he mentions it at the start is perhaps telling that maybe he thinks that he does anyway i just wanted to comment on that i don't buy this sort of idea that we should just take things uh, for granted as they appear to us because i think that that's the opposite of a skeptical approach that you should have when you're sort of trying to work out um what, what the truth is especially again in sort of contested novel unusual cases it's especially there that you should not just uh take your initial presupposition your initial presupposition or your your initial sort of sense of what it is uh, at face value all right let's continue oh that's opposite of what i wanted to do let's continue here this keeps us from being irrational skeptics and from believing anything just because we want it to be true so does doug have any good reasons to say jesus did not rise from the dead and you might say, well, dead people stay dead, 
So we know Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But sometimes the evidence for a specific event overrules a general truth. Prior to 1903, heavier than air vehicles stayed on the ground, and people thought that that kind of flight was impossible. But that didn't make it irrational to believe anecdotal reports about the Wright brothers. Plus, if Jesus' resurrection was a miracle... Okay, I wanted to comment on that. So, um, yeah, it absolutely would have been irrational, in my opinion, in 1903 for people to have, for your average person at least, to have believed anecdotal reports of... Um, the right brothers, the right brothers flying, especially if those reports were not from people who themselves had seen it flying, which is analogous in the resurrection case. If all, if the only evidence we had for the right brothers' flight in 1903 was documents written years after the event by people who were not themselves present at the event, or at least for anonymous sources who we don't know whether they were present at the event, that would, and of course, then the analogy would be today, no one can fly heavier than air, and people have tried and, and failed. Right? If that were the case, it would be completely unreasonable to believe that the Wright brothers had the Wright brothers had flown a heavy than air flight. And just to sort of substantiate that point a little further, I just wanted to show um there's something here. I've got a few little things prepared here. You know, always got to add a bit of value here, not just me blabbling on. I mean it's mostly me blabbling on, right? But it's not not just like entirely me blabbling on. Um what am I trying to do here? So I want to share realize I did this in like the least efficient way possible. Okay, so this is a Wikipedia article on the history of aviation. Um, Oops, that's not that's not what that is. What's going on here? Oh yeah, sorry about that. Um, what I just wanted to share is that there is a, like a very long history of. Let me just try to make that a little bigger. There's a very long history, as many people probably know, of people who were trying to not just who were trying to develop heavier than air flight prior to and around the time of the Wright brothers, but who also claimed to have done so. And I'm no expert on this, but this just a few minutes, uh, you know, googling around. Um, there's a few figures here that is mentioned here. Uh, let's see, not that one here. Uh, so what? there's a few claims here. This guy Whitehead and, and Pierce here. Um, uh, where where did I read this? Yeah, here's a claim here. Uh, 1901, two and a half years before the Wright Brothers flight, he claimed to have carried out a controlled powered flight in his monoplane in Connecticut. The flight was reported in a local newspaper. 30 years later, several people questioned by the researcher claimed to have seen that or other Whitehead flights. So I have no idea about whether this was a legitimate uh, flight or not. Uh, here's another one from Pierce. Um, uh, let's see. Witnesses interviewed many years afterward. Oh, that's that's appropriate. Claims that Pierce flew and landed a powered, heavier than F machine nine months before the Wright brothers flew. Documentary evidence for these claims remains open to interpret and dispute, blah, blah, blah. So those were just two examples that I saw there, and I'm pretty sure there are many others as well, of people who claimed either at the time or later to have flown a heavier than F flight prior to the Wright brothers. Many of them, I suspect, didn't, or it was equivocal. I mean, there were all sorts of developments. Like there were people who were working on glided flights. So, you know, if you have a glider that's flying kind of downhill, um, it can be a bit ambiguous maybe as to whether you've achieved heavy enough flight. The Wright brothers' first flight, I think, was only, how long was it? Like 30 meters or something? And they were only a few feet off, off the ground. It wasn't, I mean, it's impressive in the scape of technology, but, you know, it, it it's not impressive in the overall scheme of it's not like they were soaring through the air sort of thing. You, you see what I mean here? So anyway, the point I'm making here is that uh, around the time, there were many claims of people to have um, succeeded in heavy than air flight, M many, most of which, or at least many of which were not true. Um, and also the evidence presented would need to, uh, to, to warrant belief in that would need to be more than simply vague anecdotal reports that aren't sourced. That isn't what convinced people. What convinced people at the time was, first of all, like reliable reports, including photographs and, and detailed accounts of it, uh, which appeared in the years following that. And second of all, the, the fact that they were able to repeat this multiple times and then other people were able to develop on that technology. Um, and uh, it talks about here how there was um, development in Europe, apparently, off, at least initially, without a lot of um, uh, necessarily inter interplay between what was happening in America. But anyway, so... The point I want to make there is simply that, um, no, it would not have been rational to believe on the basis of unsourced um, anecdotal evidence at that time in 1903 that the Wright, brothers, the Wright brothers flew unaided. At least I don't think it would have been. I think it would have been entirely reasonable to suspend judgment and say, oh, I'm pretty skeptical about that. Come back, me with be come back to me with better evidence and then I'll believe. So uh, it's important here. So I think that the, um, the value of little cases like that is to think about, well, um, let's take that as a case study and think what what do we think is the rational or the appropriate thing to believe in a context like that? Like imagine the evidence as it would have been, say you just heard off the grapevine that these guys had, had flown. Uh, would it have been reasonable to believe that? I contend that it would not have been. And that's actually a good analogy um, for 
the situation we have with respect to the resurrection appearances, except for the fact that we're now much further away in time, uh, removed in time from the resurrection appearances, but other things are sort of similar. Um, now, Trent here is claiming that actually one would have been justified in believing that um, on the basis of just anecdotal reports, which is interesting because I think that the problem with that is to say that is that Trent then opens himself to, um, I think, having to accept a huge range of reports of all sorts of phenomenon uh, that he probably, well, I... I would say that he shouldn't be uh, receptive to, and he probably also wouldn't uh, wouldn't want to um, wouldn't want to admit. So this includes things like homeopathy, um, belief in Bigfoot, uh, Loch Ness monster, belief in uh, abduction by aliens, belief in uh, miracle claims from all sorts of religions that he rejects. Because um, there's so many claims of these of these sorts of things. Some of them I document in my book. Some of the the best ones, right? Uh, but there's many others as well that are evidenced more poorly, uh, which I think would come under the category of um, just anecdotal reports, which is just, that was the only criteria that he gave here, anecdotal reports ar around the time. Uh, so anecdotal reports of something that happened, you know, within recent, uh, you know, recently, not like hundreds of years ago, but there's so many examples of these kind of claims, um, many of which are better evidenced than um, the Wright brothers or, or the resurrection appearances. I, I think the problem with, with Trent's approach here is that he's just going to open himself up to um, extremely, um, uh, it, to be overly open to beliefs that are just not sufficiently well supported. Um, and um, so I think that's the fundamental problem with this approach. Anyway, let's move on. It would require dead people to stay dead. Otherwise, Jesus rising from the dead would not be a demonstration of God's unique power. So there's no evidence like a manuscript saying the apostles recanted their belief or anything like that that shows Jesus did not rise from the dead. There's also no missing evidence that we would expect if Jesus did, did rise from the dead. For example, it's true that ancient non-Christian historians didn't talk about Jesus' resurrection, but they also didn't talk about Christians, and we know Christians existed in the first century. So their lack of testimony about the resurrection says nothing about whether the resurrection happened. Instead, we have the evidence we would expect if Jesus rose from the dead and only appeared to his disciples. Now, let's talk about where we agree. Okay, this is actually an important part here as well. Um, so I, I agree that the fact that, uh, say, Roman or, or other Greek historians at like for, at, at the time of the first century, the fact that they don't comment on the resurrection is not good evidence that the resurrection didn't happen. So that's what Trent is claiming. I agree with that um, because there's just so – well, first of all, it's unclear how they would know that it would have happened. And second of all, we've lost so much um, from that time anyway that it's likely that uh, if, if someone had written about it, we wouldn't necessarily have it preserved. Although, of course, early Christians uh, were were, were – um, had a lot of interest in preserving those sorts of things. So maybe there's an increased chance it would have been preserved. But anyway, I still don't think it's very, it's very convincing. However, that's only one. So, so the argument here is that we, sh we don't have a uh, trend saying we, we're not missing any evidence that we would expect to have if Jesus was resurrected and appeared only to his disciples, he said. Um, now, accounts of the resurrection or reports of it outside of the New Testament, let's say, are only one category of evidence that you might think that we, we are missing. Um, and I don't think it's anything close to the most important type of evidence. So the tr one problem with this is that the sorts of evidence that we would expect to find depends on the theology, right? So let's suppose that you tell me God raised Jesus from the dead and Jesus appeared to his disciples. Um, and then you ask me, well, what else would you expect? Like, what other evidence would you expect to see or what uh, reports would you expect or something like that? it's sort of entirely unclear because like, well, why did God raise him from the dead? Like, did, did he raise Jesus from the dead to have a, like a massive disco or the Sermon of the Mount or like, I don't know, to, to build a channel, a, a, a tunnel under the channel between England and France or to like, to, to uh, end human sacrifices of the Aztecs. I don't know. The Aztecs went around there, but like, I'm just coming up with random nonsense, right? Like, I mean, I don't know what God's raising Jesus to do. He could do anything. I mean, it's God, right? So I, I don't know how to constrain my expectations when I'm only told when I'm just told that God raised Jesus and Jesus appeared to his disciples. Now you need a bit more context. You need a theology to tell you about what you expect to see. And Christians of course have that, right? That's why we need that to add to the picture here. And under the theology, the claim as I hear it, I don't know if Trent exactly says it this way, but I think this is fairly standard for Christians is to say that the reason God raised Jesus from the dead is as a vindication of Jesus's unique mission, unique salvific mission for, for, to mankind. Uh, and if that's the case, then there's a lot more evidence that I would expect to see that we do not in fact see. So if if the resurrection is supposed to be a sort of a culmination and a vindication of Jesus's um, salvific mission and a sort of a, a sign to the world, at least to some extent, uh, that of, of his you know uh, triumph over death and all that, uh, then why only appear to his disciples? Why, and maybe a few other um, 
you know, some of his family and, and a few other people who were associated with him. Why not appear to like the Roman Senate and the Sanhedrin and the Chinese emperor and, uh, you know, the Persian court and peoples in the ancient Americas, uh, you know, all over the place, really. I mean, that's a real sign to the world, right? If you're actually appearing to people all over the world, instead of like just in the exact one little place where you, um, uh, where you actually lived and taught. In fact, think about it this way. Think about the the claim that I'm going to make as a naturalist. I'm going to say essentially the the appearances of Jesus after he died are a result of a combination of you know uh, hallucinations, um, expectation bias, memory biases, social socialization, contamination, all that kind of stuff. Right? Basically, psychosocial processes. Now, think about what type of um, things I don't expect to see under that. Let's call it just a psychosocial um, explanation to to be um, to, to be brief here. I certainly don't expect to see reports of Jesus's resurrection occurring around the same time in parts of the world that didn't have that had minimal to no contact with the local region where Jesus taught, and also that didn't share any of the same or very few of the same theological beliefs. So I don't expect to see reports of Jesus appearing in China, which had little contact with the Roman world at that time, a little bit of trade, but very little like cultural exchange, um, and certainly not with like Jewish uh, illiterate, illiterate Jews in the Near East, that there was effectively no contact there, uh, and absolutely zero contact, as far as you know, with the people in the Americas. So my uh, my psychosocial explanation just really can't work in, in those cases. It does not expect to see that sort of evidence. Um, now, what about the resurrection explanation? Well, even if you don't want to say that it predicts the, that Jesus would appear to other people, because again, it's very vague and amorphous as to exactly what we would expect. At the very least, it doesn't rule it out, does it? That Jesus could well appear to those people. So, so it seems that there is actually the the, the evidence that we have, uh, even just on this aspect here of who Jesus appeared to and like where he appeared to them, uh, is is very substantially supporting the psychosocial theory because the psychosocial theory predicts that it would only appear to people who knew Jesus and those directly associated with him. Um, or at least who were sort of became aware of it later, perhaps who may also experience them, but not people who were just very distant and like culturally and spatially very distant from that. That 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 can't really be accounted for by that. Um, whereas the the resurrection hypothesis, uh, well, that's fully consistent with appearances pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so, and what are the appearances we see? Well, they're just those that would be expected by the psychosocial explanation. So I think that that strongly favors just on the, on the face of it, a psychosocial explanation for the resurrection appearances, um, and disfavors a resurrection explanation because basically we, we don't see the evidence that would be more expected under the resurrection explanation. Now you can say, well, he just didn't want to appear to other people. You know, he only had reason to appear to his disciples, even though he's supposed to be vindicating a salvific mission to the entire world. So exactly why he only wanted to appear to like 15 people plus 500, maybe. I, I don't know how that works or why God want to do that, but you can say that he did. So the point I'm making here is that, um, it's highly unclear to me why we wouldn't regard that as disconfirmatory evidence, at least to some degree, maybe not decisive, uh, but somewhat disconfirmatory. Um, so, so that's one piece of evidence, the where's and the where's and the why's and the uh, where to's of the appearances. But there's another aspect of evidence that I would expect to see, and that is accounts written very close to the period, uh, datable to that very early time and clearly with clear attestation as to their author of someone who was present at the events. Um, so basically like the Pauline epistles, except written by one of the disciples and claiming to have eyewitness experience of, um, of the events in question, that would be much stronger evidence than we currently do have of the gospels, which are written decades later and are anonymous and probably weren't written by eyewitnesses. I say probably because, you know, scholars don't always agree on that, but most, most people who, most scholars who are not, very conservative evangelicals don't think the gospels were written by eyewitnesses uh, directly, although some may think that there was uh, incorporated eyewitness testimony, but that's a somewhat different claim, right? So, um, you know, if Peter himself wrote um, a, a gospel that was attested to him, like it, it says that it was written by him and it's we can date it through various mechanisms, maybe we even have surviving manuscripts, right, uh, to, to, I don't know, the AD 30s or 40s or something, that would be much stronger evidence than we currently have. Um, now, again, think about the competing explanations here. Um, under the resurrection hypothesis, well, God in his um, in his wisdom and, you know, to um, promote his glory and so forth can divinely ordain it so that any of those things happens. Arbitrarily good evidence, even without a miracle, God can just ordain things so that, you know, um, Peter was uh, drawn to write the, uh, you know, an, an account early on and that that was preserved and we have manuscripts that date to much earlier than any of our current manuscripts and blah, 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 right? God can foreordain all that and ensure that it all uh, happens 
so as to ins- provide us with with good ev- good evidence for people who lived in other places and times, right? Um, but that can't happen under you know a naturalistic account. It's just sort of well, whatever happens to happen historically, right? Uh, maybe we'll get people writing earlier, maybe we won't. I don't know that there's a clear expectation there, other than probably there is going to be a time that elapses before you get a sufficient development of like doctrine and um, cultural memory or uh, whatever it is exactly uh, that then manifests in terms of the gospels. So the, the, what I'm saying is late anonymous gospels are much more expected, I would argue, under a naturalistic or psychosocial explanation than they are under a, a theistic, under a resurrection hypothesis. Again, it's not uh, decisive. It doesn't decisively refute, but it's more expected because um, very early um, eyewitness account, like attested uh, first person gospels are quite a lot less plausible under a psychosocial account because they rule out many of the possible mechanisms for for like legendary development or memory biases and so forth. The earlier they get and the closer to the source they get. It doesn't completely rule it out, but it reduces those. Um, so they're less expected, uh, whereas they're just as consistent as far as we can tell, maybe even more consistent with, with a resurrection account. Um, so so that's another piece of evidence that I think that we don't have. So again, the, the two two main things that I think that we're lacking that I would find more expect that I would expect under a resurrection explanation are uh, appearances in other parts of the world and to culturally diverse groups and much earlier, much better attested um, gospels or accounts of, of Jesus's appearances. Um, so those are two things that there may well be others. Um, so I think, so I just disagree with Trent here when he says that we, there's no evidence that we would expect to see that we don't see. Um, I think that, there are at least two very strong pieces of evidence that, that we don't see that favor a psychosocial account. All right, let's move on. Doug and I agree Jesus justified and that his disciples, as well as a later convert named Paul, all at least claim to have seen a resurrected Jesus. We also agree that they were sincere in their belief. And I would say this can be shown by their willingness to suffer when preaching the gospel without any kind of comparable reward in return. But maybe they were sincerely mistaken. The most common alternative explanation is that the disciples had some kind of socially contagious grief-induced hallucination. One person sees the risen Jesus as a personal hallucination, and soon other people feel compelled to say the same thing. But there are seven problems with this explanation. One, we should be skeptical the disciples were grief-stricken. It's equally likely they were angry that they wasted years of their life following yet another failed Messiah. We don't have evidence that they were all prone to having grief-induced hallucinations. Two, Paul and Jesus. So I'm going to have to pause a fair bit here because, you know, there's seven things and he goes through them quite quickly. Um, Let's see. So his claim is that they probably weren't or they may not have been grief stricken. They may have been angry. So last time I checked, you can be grief stricken and angry at the same time or like you can feel grief and then feel anger and then you can feel grief. Um, Maybe also some of them felt anger. Some of them felt grief. Like what kind of... it's hard to take this argument seriously. Like, well, they could, they, all of them only could have felt anger and not grief in any way, uh, such that that just rules out bereavement hallucinations. And, and by the way, I mean, it doesn't even have to be the disciples. It could have been one of the, uh, the women followers, um, such as, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus or Mary Magdalene, or one of the other, uh, women followers who, who initially experienced the bereavement hallucination. I mean, we don't know. There's not enough evidence to substantiate that. But no, they were just all so angry. Even Jesus's mother was just really angry the whole time. <laughs> so they were never able to feel feel grief, even though I think you can be angry and feel grief. I mean, like, is this a serious point? This is just bizarre. I, I don't I, I don't even understand. Like, What's the evidence that that just this this overriding anger makes it impossible or exceptionally unlikely to experience brutal nations? I, I, I don't know where this is. This just seems very ad hoc to me. Jesus's brother James were not grief stricken over Jesus's death because they weren't believers when he was crucified. So this doesn't explain their later conversions. Three- okay, yeah. So the the brothers of Jesus. And now, um, to my knowledge, or oh, I should have double checked this one beforehand. Um, from what I recall, the evidence we have with respect to this is that at some point during Jesus's ministry, it says that Jesus's one of the gospels says that Jesus's brothers were not believers. And then at some point, I think it might be an Acts, or at least after the resurrection, we we have accounts of Jesus's brothers um, being believers and, and engaging in ministry. Um, so I don't think that there's any, that there's sufficient evidence to establish, even, even if you just take those statements at face value, which I don't think we should, but even if you do, there's not sufficient evidence to establish the timeline of when they converted. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't, it's not clearly established that, uh, they were skeptics right up to the resurrection and just afterwards, but then maybe a few days or weeks afterwards, they had an appearance and then converted. Um, this is a, I, I don't know why p- apologists still make this argument because it's just a classic fallacy. It's post hoc ego prompter hoc. Um, 
and it, in fact, it's not even post hoc because we don't even know that the conversion occurred after Jesus. As far as I can, as far as I remember, someone correct me if I'm wrong. We don't even know if Jesus's brothers converted after Jesus resurrected. All we know that is that they, at some point during his ministry, were not believers. Um, so we don't even know if it's post hoc, uh, but certainly post hoc ergo prompter hoc because. Uh, after this, therefore, because of this is what that means, right? Um, just because, G uh, just because uh, Jesus's brothers converted um, after Jesus's resurrection, that doesn't, uh, or after the appearances of his resurrection, uh, like to the disciples, it doesn't mean that they converted because of those. <laughs> we, we actually have no idea why they converted because it doesn't say. So this is just this is Trent just making things up, which is uh, I don't hold him accountable for this so much because apologists have been doing this for so long. I think that they've almost convinced themselves that we actually have evidence that Jesus's brothers converted because of an appearance or, or some power, uh, some like a resurrection appearance, even though there's no evidence of that at all. It's just entirely, um, entirely an inference drawn from very little textual evidence, basically post hoc ego prompter hoc. So I just don't accept this as an argument at all. Three. Studies on grief-induced hallucinations show that true hallucinations are not common. Naomi Simon's 2011 study showed that the majority of widowers do not experience grief hallucinations. The Hayes and Ludar 2013 study only found one case of grief-induced hallucination involving a non-family member. Nearly every single case involves family members. And a 2020 meta-review of these studies showed that these cases, they involved feeling the presence of a deceased person, not actually interacting with someone. Only 2% involved hallucinating a tactile experience of the dead which is the only case that parallels what we have of the prolonged encounters with an embodied Jesus that are described in Luke and John's Gospels, and as well are also described in Paul's letter when he says that Jesus appeared to the 500 at once. Grief hallucinations also tend to... Uh, okay, so he goes on a bit more about grief hallucinations, but I need to respond to some of what he said here. Um, so it's true that bereavement hallucinations do not happen in the majority of, of people, um, but... So I agree with that part, but let, let's take a step back before we jump into some of the more details of what he just said there and think about the, because I don't think he's really clear about this. And, and if he's, if Trent was clear about why he's raising this argument, um, then I think that it would be clearer why it's a bad argument. So what Trent is saying here, and he says it at other points as well, is that because the base rates for these ki the kinds of bereavement hallucinations and maybe group hallucinations or, or contamination, whatever, like these other mechanisms that we might postulate, because the base rates are low, they don't happen very often. Therefore, we should um, we should infer that they probably didn't happen in the case of Jesus and his followers, right? Uh, okay, so that's that's the structure of his argument. Now, think back to just a few, well, okay, it was a few minutes in the debate. It's It's been a few tens of minutes in, in my video now because I talk too much. But remember what he Trent started out by saying. He started out by saying that uh, effectively base rates, although he didn't use that phrase, but basically um, the, the general experience that we have or um, longstanding trends or something to that effect can be overturned by just one example, one single piece of evidence. Remember, that's the, the Wright brothers. The, the observation or the belief or the fact that heavier than air flight was impossible is overturned by, in, in fact, according to Trent, our belief in that should have been overturned by just hearing anecdotal reports of the Wright brothers' first flight, not even like strong evidence of it, just anecdotal reports. Um, so let's let's now apply that to what Trent's saying here. Um, as a naturalist, I'm licensed by Trent, according to his own argument, it seems to me at least, to say, well, okay, Trent, yes, yeah, the base rates for all of these things are low. Yep, they don't happen very often. Uh, but I know that they happen in this case because of the evidence that I see, right? I, I see the evidence for um, the you know, Jesus's followers claiming that they saw a risen Jesus and the, the stories of these being passed on and written down and so forth. So that's the evidence I need to infer that... Uh, although it's very unlikely and maybe has never happened before, in this case, in fact, these psychological mechanisms did occur and did take place in the relevant way. Basically, Trent, I think, is using inconsistent arguments here. He wants to argue that a single unique event can overturn a general trend or, or general evidence because he wants to argue for the resurrection being a miracle. But now he wants to, do, he wants to discredit or refute um, naturalistic explanations of the resurrection on the basis that they don't, uh, it, it seems that they are rare or the relevant mechanisms don't happen very often. But I don't see how you can use both of those arguments at the same time. The only way I think you could rec you could rescue this is to say that the only way that the naturalistic type psychosocial arguments will work is if the mechanisms involved like happen all the time. Um, well, and I, I just don't know why that would be the case. It could be that, yes, the process has happened, but the combination of events only only gives rise to resurrection type appearances very rarely in the right context. And indeed, I think that that is something, uh, something close to the truth, although I don't think it's 
the, the um, appearances to Jesus, uh, oh, sorry, the appearances of Jesus are unique. I think they are unusual because of a unique combination of circumstances that occurred historically. But but the point is, which way does Trent want to argue it? Does he want to say that we need a strong baseline evidence to establish that a, an, a, an explanation is plausible? In which case, how many how many equivalent cases do we have of God resurrecting someone as a vindication of his divine mission? I don't think there are any. Uh, so that's not going to work. On the other hand, um, if we can use a unique historical event or like a unique set of evidence um, to overturn general trends or at least to, to serve as an exception to that, then what's the problem with the naturalists just appealing to the fact that, yes, it was an unusual, unique historical combination of these factors? Um, and, and we know that because, well, that, that we see that from the evidence, right? I see that as a parody to what Trent's doing. He's going to say, well, God doesn't usually resurrect people from the dead, but this was a unique circumstance, right? The naturalist is going to say, well, sure, groups of people don't usually report um, seeing people that they knew come back from the dead, but this was a unique circumstance. Um, so so what, why is that a bad argument under Trent's own logic? It seems that it's a perfectly acceptable form of inference. So I, I really think that there's an inconsistency in the structure of, of Trent's argument here. Okay, so let's underline that. And now let's turn to some of the more specifics that he mentioned about, about the study. So I didn't look up all of the studies that he mentioned, but I did look up this one here um, because of the particular claim that he made. So again, I, I agree, and I think that this is just just the case um, that, yeah, most uh, people who experience bereavement do not experience a bereavement hallucination. But, uh, I mean, that's never really been the claim, right? It doesn't have to be most. Uh, the question is how plausible is it that that would have occurred or could have occurred to the disciples? So here's uh, the paper that I think he's referring to when he mentioned the um, uh, Naomi Simon uh, paper here. Um, and this is sometimes, the phenomena here is sometimes called complicated bereavement, which is, or complicated grief, which is a broader category that includes bereavement hallucinations, but is not limited to those. Um, now, what did I want to show you here? There's a lot of sort of the usual sort of study stuff, you know, details and things that are actually important <laughs> when we want to assess whether things are true, not just, oh, well, it seems to be the case, therefore I will. Like, we actually need to use evidence. But anyway, uh, I've, I've gone over that point before. Um, there was one statistic that I wanted to show you here. I'm just trying to find it. Um, it was the proportion of sample respondents here or that experienced a hallucination of some sort. I'm sorry that I have seemed to have lost it. No, it wasn't this one. Um, because Trent just reports this as most people don't experience a bereavement hallucination, but I, I, I don't know that anyone's claimed otherwise, at least I haven't. Um, ah, yes, I think this is it. Uh, oh, that's right, because you have to scroll down here. Oh, yeah, okay, so here's a few... Um, his few percentages. I could have sworn I saw another one here that was broader. So, so these are two cl classes of people: those who scored sufficiently to warrant, um, uh, to warrant the I, I don't know if it's diagnosis or the, the categorization as experiencing complicated uh, grief, and those who didn't. Right. So these are like true and and false. Right. Um, so then these are the percentages in both groups who reported this particular um, uh, behavior or experience. Uh, so you can see most most of these are not like any sort of hallucinatory thing, but there are some. So I see the person who died stand before me. Um, this is the percentage uh, shown here. So 10% of those who did ex who did um, report some of the, across the threshold there, which is slightly less than half of the sample. Um, I hear the voice of the person who died speak to me. That's uh, again, about 10% of those who cross the threshold. So what is that of the overall sample? Something like 5%. Um, there's some others as well. Uh, and... I swear there was another, wait, is it this one? Ah, oh, yeah, here it is. This is what I was looking for. Hallucinations of the deceased. So 24%, so that's like any type of hallucination, I suppose, um, in in that part of the sample, uh, much smaller percent in those who don't meet the criteria, right? So roughly speaking, if you say this is a little less than half, maybe 10% of the sample experienced some sort of hallucination of the deceased. That's that's really what I wanted to share there. Um, so 10% is a lot less than 100%, right? So it is indeed a minority. But 10% is also by no means that rare. It's actually fairly common, which is exactly what I claim in my book. They're not the majority case, but they are fairly common. And if you think about how many disciples Jesus is supposed to have had, if I recall correctly, it was 12. That is more than 10, which means that statistically, I mean, we can't assume that these statistics apply, uh, you know, in, in the in a different cultural context, but 
you know, uh, at least it's the best guess. Statistically, we would have expected at least one of Jesus' disciples, pl plus your add on the women followers, to have experienced some sort of complicated grief or complicated bereavement or, or, or induced hallucination. Now, of course, that doesn't get you all, all the way to resurrection appearances, right? Um, it's only the first step there because most people who experience grief, uh, hallucination or bereavement hallucination do not come to believe that their loved one uh, is still alive, right? Uh, but the point is, uh, I think Trent's citation of this study in support of his contention here, I mean, literally, he just says most people don't experience it, which, again, I agree with. But I would say this study supports my contention that it's quite reasonable to believe that at least one of Jesus's followers experienced some sort of bereavement induced hallucination, be it audio or um, audio or visual or combination, um, which was one of the key triggers for the subsequent appearances. So I claim this study supports my contention. And I don't think that Trent really addressed that key aspect there, that it doesn't have to be the majority case. It just has to be not sufficiently unreasonable to think that it happened. And again, that's uh, that's all putting aside the question as to, well, if we can infer even if we can infer that there was an exception uh, that just sort of counters the base rate, then does it even matter how plausible it is? But even putting that aside, if you think that it does need to be somewhat plausible on the basis of base rates, uh, I think we've got that as well. Um, statistically, it's likely that at least one of Jesus's followers would have experienced a bereavement hallucination, according to the study that he cited. Okay, let's keep going. To persist for many years after death. But the claims that Jesus appeared right, to let me just jump back a little bit here. prolonged and hallucinating a tactile experience of the dead which is the only case that parallels what we have of the prolonged encounters with an embodied Jesus that are described in Luke and John's Gospels, and as well are also described in Paul's letter when he says that Jesus appeared to the 500 at once. Grief hallucinations also... Wait, is that supposed to be a prolonged embodied encounter? Let, let me... What's he claiming of the 500 appearance there? Presence of a deceased person, not actually interacting with someone. Only 2% involved hallucinating a tactile experience of the dead which is the only case that parallels what we have of the prolonged encounters with an embodied Jesus. He's saying that the 500 is an example of a prolonged encounter with an embodied Jesus. Let me, let me make sure I got that right. That are described in Luke and John's Gospels, and as well are also described in Paul's letter when he says that Jesus appeared to the 500 at once. Yeah, yeah. So he's saying that that is because he says, and are also described, referring to the prolonged embodied account, are also described in Paul's letter when he talks about the 500. That's ridiculous. It literally just says he appeared to 500 at once. That could be a vague Jesus looking thing in the clouds that people interpreted as Jesus. We have so many examples of that um, from, well, from all sorts of religions across the world, right? I, 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 that is the, I don't know why apologists appeal to this so much. It's by far the weakest of all the resurrection appearances. Um, the appearances to the disciples are much stronger because they involve people who actually knew Jesus. Um, and at least the claims are that he appeared in smaller group settings where they would have, at least if it was anything like what they report it was, that um, they would have been able to at least plausibly identify Jesus, right? Um, the fact that someone appears to people who did not uh, know them during while they were alive is way less plausible. That's when you get Elvis sightings, uh, of which there have been many. But no one who actually knew Elvis when he was alive, to my knowledge, I looked this up years ago, but I, I doubt it's changed. No one actually who knew Elvis while he was alive claimed to have seen him after he died. So it's a lot less credible when people didn't actually know him very well. But that's what all you have from the 500. Like how many of those 500 actually knew Jesus well enough to have known what he would have looked like from a distance? Um, so I, but anyway, it's certainly not a prolonged uh, tactile encounter with him. I, I just that's really stretching the definition there. But anyway, putting putting the five hundred aside and just talking about the other accounts, yeah. So the Gospels do provide accounts again, I, not the five hundred, but do provide other accounts of Jesus interacting with uh, the disciples in a prolonged basis. You know, eating fish and touching the, the um, holes in his hands and all this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely, it does report that, and we don't have much evidence of that from complicated bereavement cases. There are some interesting case studies. I might mention a few later, but yeah, it's true that we don't, it's certainly quite uh, atypical. So the question is, uh, should we regard those accounts in the gospels as sufficiently reliable to take them as just sort of established facts, right? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think we should. And th th at this point is where I'd pass over to people like Bart Ehrman, who have discussed at length uh, about the overall reliability, trustworthiness of the gospels. Many apologists uh, are reluctant to appeal to very specific details in the Gospels because of this reason, that, that you just can't establish that, that they're actually historical. They were only written decades after the event. They're anonymous. We don't know what the sources were. Even if the sources were eyewitnesses who, uh, like even if they did have eyewitness testimony that they could appeal to, which I think is unlikely that they had direct eyewitness testimony, but supposing they did, uh, there's no reason to suppose that these eyewitnesses would have been reliable uh, thinking decades back to events that uh, are highly emotionally colored and charged by uh, 
theological interpretations. There's just so much evidence about the unreliability of eyewitness testimony, and especially when you apply it to something that's highly emotionally charged like this. Um, I, I don't see any reason for for accepting these these accounts as uh, as vertical. Yes, I accept that there were appearances to groups of that. that Many of Jesus's immediate followers, like the disciples, did report experiences of Jesus appearing to them in group settings. I accept that. Um, and I think Doug accepted that, at least for the sake of argument in this debate, right? But it's a long way from accepting that to accepting the specifics of those encounters as specified in the Gospels. And again, too many apologists just don't seem to understand this point, or at least don't acknowledge this point in debates, where it's like, oh, well, you accept the appear group appearances, therefore, let me consult the whatever the chapter of the John when it says that this particular thing happened with this particular location. Well, hang on a minute, that, that, that doesn't follow at all from the from accepting a general group appearance or, or multiple group appearances to accepting the specifics of the account. So I, I would say, unless Trent can establish that those things plausibly happened historically, like with sufficient plausibility, I'm just going to say they didn't happen. And that's the best explanation for the alleged facts of them. They didn't happen. Grief hallucinations also tend to persist for many years after death. But the claims that Jesus appeared to his disciples stop after just a few weeks after the, the crucifixion. In addition, Paul, as well as report... Yes, the claims stop. That doesn't mean the appearance has stopped. We actually have no idea if the appearance has stopped. How do you know that um, Jesus' mother stopped seeing appearances of her son or any kind of vision of her son after... Uh, you know, after Pentecost. Like, how do we know that? How do we know that Peter stopped seeing visions for that matter? But like, we don't, like we, we have no evidence for this other than what it says really in Acts. Uh, and again, historical reliability of Acts, you can question that. But I mean, in general, I'm happy to say that, yeah, the um, uh, many of these sort of public appearances, uh, like officially um, accepted appearances ceased after Pentecost. I think I'll comment on that a little later because Trent, I think, mentions it again. But um, what, I mean, does that mean that there weren't any other appearances? We, we don't have any evidence for that. That's an argument from silence, which is typically not accepted um, by apologists. And Trent has indicated before that while we wouldn't expect Roman sources to say about Jesus, so why would we expect early Christian sources to report accounts of their own personal experiences with Jesus, like if Mary kept seeing him or Peter or whatever? Um, why would we expect to see have any evidence of that at all? Um, so I, I don't, again, I don't see that this is a fact that I, as a naturalist, is sort of required to accept. Furthermore, not all bereavement hallucinations last for years. I mean, I think it's highly variable. He hasn't cited any particular studies on this. I know some of them can last for a long time, but not all of them do. I mean, so this is very weak to begin with. I just, I, this is so, this is such a vague point that I like. It's it's not established that they that appearances stopped in the case of Jesus, and it's not established that that appearances typically last for a very long time in the present. So I just, there's very little of substance here. I think in Luke and John's Gospels tell us that Jesus appeared to groups of people, including, as I said, up to 500 at one time. The closest thing that we have to group hallucinations, or mass hysteria, usually involve people psychosomatically experiencing a similar illness, not individuals claiming to all see the same thing that doesn't exist. In 2015, Dr. Joseph Bergeron surveyed thousands of cases in the medical literature. He could not find a single case of group grief hallucination comparable to the group appearances described in the New Testament. This means that, oh. that private fleeting appearances of the dead that last sometimes for years do not explain the public embodied group appearances that only occurred for a few weeks to the apostles. Yeah, okay. So that, uh, I forget the, the gentleman he mentioned there um, who apparently looked at hundreds of, uh, hang on, uh, yeah, Joseph Bergen, Bergen, um, so who apparently looked at hundreds of cases. So I, I looked up his website and he doesn't really say anything about that. I mean, he wrote a book about this, right? Uh, and it seems that he does talk a bit about bereavement and like conversion disorder and mass theory, but I can't find a claim about what Trent just said. That might only be in his book. I, I didn't look at the book. But the point is, this guy's a Christian apologist. He surveys the medical literature and claims that he doesn't find what he is kind of required to not find as a Christian apologist. I don't know. I, I don't take that very seriously. Um, but more to the point is, I don't think that there is a such thing as group hallucinations anyway. Um, hallucinations as typically characterized in the psychological literature are private experiences. So you can't have a group hallucination. It's just the wrong word to use, which is why in my book, I talk about collective experiences of the risen Jesus and experience is broader. It doesn't entail that it's just a private event. It, it, it's an experience that's, that's something you sort of report after the fact. I mean, I guess you could report it during, uh, during the experience, right? But, but typically it's reported after the fact it's, it's an experience. It's something that happened to you, but the nature of which, well, we don't necessarily know. Whereas if you say something was a hallucination, you're making a claim about the, the psychological source 
of that experience, which is that it was effectively entirely mental. I mean, there may have been some sort of trigger in the real world, but whatever the experience was doesn't in any way correspond to, to that in a, in a normal way. So, so the point is, um, and skeptics sometimes get this wrong as well, so I think we should be clear about this, we should not appeal to collective hallucinations or group hallucinations. This is a non-standard terminology that's not really used in the psychological literature. Hallucinations are typically used to refer to private psychological experiences of an individual. They can't be shared in this way. But we don't need them to be. That's the, the, the naturalist or the proponent of psychosocial explanations does not in any way need to appeal to collective or group hallucinations. All they need to do is be able to explain how groups of people can come to have a shared experience or what they regard as a shared experience of some sub supernormal or supernatural or miraculous event. And th that's all we need to explain, right? Because that's, that's the fact on the table here. Um, and can we do that? I think we can. So I'm not going to go over all the evidence now, but there are many, uh, many accounts in literature of what I call collective um, religious experiences or collective experience of other paranormal phenomenon. Um, I have a large compendium of them in my book, which you encourage to check out. Uh, most of them are from religious context, but uh, some of them are also from like paranormal um a spiritualist sort of context. One of the difficulties here is that there is no established body of, of investigative literature, like scholarly literature that seeks to document and explain these sorts of things. The closest that I can find is that there was quite a lot of research into parapsychology in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I do rely on some of the accounts of that, although I, I don't know how much that has been st like studied in the contemporary space and like documented well. So I'm just going on what I found from it. But the point is here, we have, a, we have an asymmetry. We have Christian apologists who have a lot of money and time to spend trying to develop the best account for Jesus that we have, that they can rather. And on the other hand, we have no real established uh, discipline whose interest is in like documenting uh, collective uh, religious experiences and giving accounts as to why they happen. There are scattered reports in uh, like anthropology uh, and psychology and medicine about s some aspects of this, but the, the idea that the, the point is that there is no, uh, there is no scholarly field that s seeks to uh, like catalog, catalog, document, and particularly come up with explanations for these sort of phenomena. Um, so, I don't. I, the point the point I make there is, I think that what we have documented is only the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many other accounts that just haven't been subject to to critical scrutiny. Um, and so, the fact that we have so many, which a layperson like me can can document um, on the basis of things that that have been published in literature, even though there's not really a field that does this. Um, uh, I mean, I, I take it as actually quite convincing that these sorts of things do happen. Um, and so the, the other thing that I think Trent, building on that, the other thing that Trent is missing here is he seems to think that he, we need to jump straight from, say, a private bereavement hallucination to a tactile experience of Jesus eating fish or something. But you don't have to jump straight to that. What There's a process. And again, I document this in my book. Others have made similar arguments, right? What you, what you, you start with is say, I don't know, Mary, mother of Jesus, experiences a bereavement hallucination. She reports that to, I don't know, Peter, one of the disciples. Meanwhile, Peter has also heard about the empty tomb, if you accept that, which I do, at least for the sake of argument. So now Peter's heard about the empty tomb and this uh, appearance of Jesus. Plus, he's trying to work out what just happened. He didn't expect Jesus to die. How does this reconcile with him being the Messiah? He's trying to work all that out. He's he's frightened. He's uh, he's afraid. He's concerned. He's angry. He's what it, like he's everything at once, right? Um He's praying, and then uh, he's praying, he's reading the scriptures, he's, he's whatever, he's probably fasting, uh, and then he experiences, on the basis of all of those um, uh, promptings and, um, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, priming, a an experience of, of Jesus as well. And then he tells the other disciples, and he's like, oh, Jesus appeared to me. And then there's double priming. Now there's there's Mary's report and there's Peter's report. Peter's probably carrying more weight because he was a leer and, you know, all that. Um, and then they are praying and fasting together. And then they have some kind of experience. Um, hard to say what it was. I, I talk about some of these and some of the limited literature that does exist about these sort of collective experiences. Uh, there's some research in Pentecostal worship experiences, uh, worship events, for example, uh, that has been studied. But it's it's it, there's not a lot of scholarship on this, but there, there is a little bit that, that I document. Um, so that there's ways that those, those sort of... Um, experiences can be constructed in the right environment. But of course, that doesn't mean that the experience at is originally what it was later reported to be in the Gospels. It was some experience of Jesus, uh, something that they interpreted to be Jesus bringing to them. And then later, when they're talking about it amongst themselves, their accounts become better reconciled. And then there's memory biases that crop up over time. 
that improve the impressiveness and the and the coherence of the accounts as they then begin reporting this to other people. And then, of course, you've got decades of oral tradition developing and people are surmising, well, what must it have been like to have experienced this and, and developing accounts and writing them in the Gospels, right? It's a multi-stage process that gradually kind of builds momentum leading from an initial bereavement hallucination to reports in the Gospels decades later, right? There's multiple people involved here. There's multiple processes. There's multiple events. It's not just jump straight from one to the other. This is a straw man. Well, at least of my position, right? I suppose maybe there are some uh, some naturalist or whatever who would argue for a, a, a much more direct, um, I don't know, process. But it seems to me that that's at least unnecessary. Um, and so I, I, I don't see. Uh, so it's Trent effectively saying that oh, it has to. You have to sort of jump right, right from one to the other. Um, I, I would regard that as a straw man. Or at least not responding to the best version of the case, I suppose, because if some people have argued that, then it's not technically a straw man. But anyway, um, so but the, the question is, wh why do we have to think that it was a jump from one to the other? That, that's much less plausible than thinking it was a, a, a progressive development. And by the way, when I say progressive, that doesn't mean that it has to have taken years, although I think the final accounts as they appeared in the Gospels took years to develop. But the fundamentals of it, like the, you know, some early creeds such as Paul reports, that could have been developed within weeks or maybe months. These sort of things don't take long <laughs> to, to develop and circulate. Um, so I, I don't, yeah, I just I just don't see why, why we are, f are forced into this dichotomy here of, oh, it's just implausibly jumped from a, a fleeting private experience to um, now experiencing Jesus eating with us, something like that. That, that. That's not, that's not what the account is. Yeah. So for, for these sort of, for these sort of reasons, um, I'm, I'm not very convinced by Trent's response here. Let's keep going. Four. Many people who have grief-induced hallucinations eventually come to believe it was just an hallucination, and none of them believe that their loved one had risen from the dead or that they weren't dead anymore. But this wasn't the case with the apostles. Five, since ancient Jews believe the resurrection... Yeah, so it's certainly true that most people who experience bereavement hallucinations do not come to believe that their spouse is actually dead. There are some cases where that is reported. I document that in my book. Uh, but they're unusual, It's uh, to be sure. So is the resurrection of Jesus. So it's this this case of are we allowed to appeal to base rates or are we not allowed to appeal to them? I think Trent's being inconsistent here. Even if this was the only time ever where someone had been convinced by a bereavement hallucination that their loved one was actually still alive, I could just say, well, yeah, it's an unusual case, which is um, which we can believe happened because of the unique evidence for this particular case, just like the Wright brothers, right? What would be wrong with that argument? Because that's precisely what Trent's doing with respect to the resurrection. But I think that we don't even have to say that because we can say, well, there are some other cases that have been documented. So some cases, on the one hand, some cases of people uh, experiencing bereavement hallucinations and coming to believe that the loved one actually is, is still alive versus zero cases of God resurrecting people from the dead apart from Jesus, right? So which, if that's important to you, which are you going to go with? I, I would say that you should go with the, the psychosocial explanation on that front. Oh, also, we don't know that um, all of Jesus's followers continue to believe that he was alive. That's an assumption that Christians typically make, but there's not actually evidence for that. We, we know that certainly some of them did. You know, we have records at least of Peter and, and some of them continuing to teach afterwards. Do we have reliable records that all of them continue to believe that Jesus appeared to them? No, we don't. That's just later tradition and an assumption that Christians make. So we, we don't actually know that. It could well be that some of them had doubts and fell away later. We wouldn't know uh, that's, that's, that's just as consistent with their evidence as, as the contrary. So I, I, again, Christians often make these sort of implicit claims. Don't, or Christian apologists at least, don't let them get away with it. Ask them what's the evidence for that. And often they don't have evidence for it. It's just tradition that that all of the you know disciples uh, experienced these um, martyr deaths or whatever. But, but we don't know that all of them did that. Resurrection wouldn't take place until the end of the world. It follows that even if they had these grief-induced hallucinations, which doesn't explain all of them, they would have thought they saw Jesus's soul in heaven, not his glorified body on earth. Only a prolonged encounter with an embodied Jesus explains why the disciples preached Jesus was resurrected rather than preaching that his soul was with God in heaven. Moreover, given their fierce monotheism, we would expect the disciples to hallucinate Jesus as a man caught up to heaven and not as the creator himself, unless Jesus told them he used divine power to raise himself from the dead. Six, the New Testament... I don't quite understand that last point, unless Jesus told himself he used divine power to raise himself... Yeah, I, I don't understand what he's trying to say there. But with respect to, well, we would expect, we would ex basically, we would have expected the disciples to have to, to have hallucinated differently, um, unless they had a prolonged tactile encounter with Jesus. Well, no, actually, that's fundamentally mistaken because that is, uh, in fact, I think there's a formal fallacy here. But but it's uh, whatever it's formally called. This is making the the assumption that the the reality of something is sufficient to explain why people act on the basis of that reality, right? So if Jesus appeared 
sorry, if Jesus really did appear in a bodily like tactile form to the disciples, that would be sufficient and necessary and sufficient to motivate them to, to uh, behave on the basis of that. Therefore, for example, to proclaim his resurrection. No, it's not. What you need is the disciples to believe that Jesus appeared to them in a tactile embodied way, right? It's not Jesus actually appearing in that way, because if somehow the disciples got it wrong and they and Jesus really did appear to them in a tactile way, but they misinterpreted it somehow, they could still be teaching that he was taken up to heaven and, and didn't resurrect bodily, right? Conversely, um, and this is more relevant for my case, right? If the disciples falsely came to believe that Jesus had appeared to them in a tactile bodily way, then they would teach exactly the same thing as if Jesus really did appear to them in a tactile bodily way. You see what I'm saying here? It's not the reality of it that's critical here for the disciples' later teachings and practice. It's what they believed that's important. And again, apologists regularly, in my experience, make this uh, make this mistake here. They assert that just because something was the case, like in terms of the resurrection or, or whatever, that therefore it, it explains why people acted uh, on that basis. Whereas it's the beliefs of the people that is critical here. So all I need to say is, well, the disciples believed that they had these experiences of a tactile embodied Jesus. And that's precisely what I've been trying to explain is the nature of how those experiences developed. Um, so at, at this point, there's really no difference here. Trent says that they uh, that they taught the resurrection because they be they believed that they had experienced a tactile embodied Jesus. And I say exactly the same thing. So th that, that you, you can't say that that is a basis for distinguishing um, the theories because they, they predict the same thing from that point. The question is, how do they account for why the disciples came to believe that they had a tactile embodied experience? And I think that th that can be accounted for actually better, as I've been arguing, uh, on, the, on a sort of a psychosocial basis, as opposed to a, a resurrection hypothesis. But yeah, this this failure to consider the the subjective state of the disciples as being critical a critical mediator here is I think at the at the core of this mistake, which a lot of apologists make in my view. Authors repeatedly make it clear when someone has a dream or a vision in Greek or Rama, and when they think they've seen a ghost or a spirit. But none of those words are ever used to describe Jesus's resurrection body. In fact, the Greek words for resurrection, anastasis and agero, are never used in the New Testament to refer to spirits being raised. There's also no good reason to doubt Luke's testimony that the apostles sincerely believed Jesus was physically resurrected, given Luke's connection to Paul, his track record of reliably recording details in the book of Acts, and the unanimity of the authorship of the gospel attributed to him. I'm not going to talk about all of those things that would get us far too uh, broad, but I, I can't help but notice a, um, well, what I would regard as a shifting the burden of proof here. He said, Trent said that there's no reason to doubt um, Luke's claim about uh, the disciples believing in the bodily resurrection. Well, I think the question should be, is there reason to believe that it's true? Not, is there reason to doubt it? Like, uh, again, I, I mean, maybe this comes to what he was saying, what Trent said at the start here. I take a skeptical attitude to most claims, as certainly in anything that's, anything that's even s sort of slightly removed from, you know, very common everyday experiences of my own life uh, and anything that's remotely contested. I take a skeptical attitude, which doesn't mean I just deny everything, though, but it means, you know, I, I'm going to be skeptical. I'm going to kind of doubt it. I'm not going to be so sure. Uh, I take a skeptical attitude to any sorts of claims like that and only develop a view or at least try to only develop a view when I think that I, I can see good evidence for it. So merely because someone claims uh, such and so is the case, um, I don't know that to me, that's not going to be sufficient without further corroboration. Now, Trent did kind of offer further corroboration, but I just, I don't know, the way that's presented seems a bit off to me. What I think the way you should phrase it is that we should, we should believe what Luke says here because so and so and so on again, and not, there's no reason to doubt it because yeah, anyway, I, I just think that that's a, a, a bit of a shifting of the burden of proof here, but, but that's a minor point again, because for, from my point of view, I'm quite happy to uh, say that the disciples believed that Jesus was bodily resurrected. I know that there is disputes on this point, but I find those extremely boring um, about debating about what this Greek word you uh, meant. Uh, like uh, the gospels were written decades afterwards. The Greek authors could have used whatever words they wanted to, as far as I'm concerned. And, and how do we even know we can get into their mindsets like 2000 years later about exactly what they, what nuanced theological point they were trying to make as just by using these words. I think that that's just a fool's game. I don't think we can get anywhere by doing that. And, you know, I'm a non-specialist, so take that with a grain of salt. But I just find those debates about, well, he used this word and not this word to be incredibly boring and uninteresting. But the fact of the matter is that I don't see any reason why the disciples couldn't have come to believe in a bodily resurrection on the basis of experiences, which they interpreted as bodily experiences. That's all we need. You don't, you, you don't require them to have actually experienced a resurrected Jesus, merely that they believed that they had experienced a resurrected Jesus. That's why they started teaching it. Seven. Since the resurrection was preached in Jerusalem within a few weeks of the crucifixion, the disciples or enemies of the faith could have checked Jesus' tomb to see if they were hallucinating. To make a comparison, since 2010, the Spanish government thought that Juana Escudero was dead and buried in a certain grave due to a clerical error. So Escudero had that body dug up in 2017 to prove it was not her. 
And that's a sensible thing to do. If people say a living person is really in a grave, you dig up the grave to prove they're wrong. Likewise, if Christians say a dead person is not in a grave, like Jesus, you can dig up the grave to prove they are wrong. The word bury, a taphe in Greek, is always used in the New Testament to refer to formal burial. It's never used to describe dumping a body in a pit. And the fact that Jesus received a burial has the same amount of independent sources supporting it as other facts about Jesus that nearly all scholars accept, like that, like that he had 12 disciples, for example. Finally, the evidence suggests the apostles visited the tomb and found it empty, since the first recorded visitors were women, which wouldn't make sense to describe if the entire account were fabricated, since women's testimony was considered unreliable in the ancient world. So why should we not believe this evidence? Well, okay, yeah, I, f I feel like we meandered a little bit on that point. So the the key claim here was that, um, hang on, what was the key claim here? So we got onto the women, but he was talking about how, oh yeah, that's right. So the enemies or skeptics or whoever would have dug up Jesus's body to prove that it was, uh, that, that he was still um that he hadn't actually risen. Uh, Craig uses this argument a lot. I think it's incredibly an incredibly weak argument. Um, I think, first and foremost, how do you know they didn't? And again, th this comes back to the point that I, I think is just really um, underappreciated with respect to these debates with apologists. When they make these sorts of claims or imply, it's not even directly a claim, it's an implied claim. The implied claim is that no one tried to or did actually dig up Jesus's body um, to, to prove that he wasn't you know, resurrected. What is the evidence for that claim? Would we expect to see that evidence preserved if if an attempt had been made? I don't see any reason why we would, right? That we have no other accounts about Jesus from the first century other than I think Josephus. And he really and most of these early accounts don't say anything about Jesus other than apparently what they've heard about him from Christians. Uh, I don't I don't get the impression that any of these uh secondary authors, mostly from like second and later centuries, have any independent um access to, to facts about Jesus beyond what they've sort of generally heard from Christians. You know, which is fine. That does at least show that there were Christians around and that they they got reports about uh, that other people heard uh, what they believed. But but the point is, we wouldn't really expect Christians to report this if th they had dug up a body and claimed that it was Jesus's body. Whether or not it actually was, of course, then there's a whole other issue there. But I mean, the point is, what's the evidence that no one did dig up a body that they claimed was Jesus's? So that's one point. Second of all, um, particularly in a climate such as uh, Palestine, but even just more generally bodies become unrecognizable within a few days so digging up a body would not have proven anything um uh, his supporters would not have believed that we have ab we have ample evidence about irrational belief persistence that there is <laughs> there are much much easier disproved claims that people go on believing um covid denialism i think is a very prominent example of that uh for recently there's a nice little article you can find about covid deniers who died of covid19 um Many of whom apparently on their deathbed still still didn't change their mind. I mean, there's other examples of this sort of irrational belief persistence that I cite in my book. Um, so even if the, I mean, the thing is that even if the enemies of Jesus had dug up his body and persuaded, it wouldn't have even been irrational to believe uh, that that wasn't really the body because unless it was very, very, like within a couple of days afterwards, there's no way you could have even told that it was the body. It's not like they had modern forensic techniques. So, so skepticism wouldn't have been even irrational at that point, I think. Uh, but even if it would have been rational, uh, that doesn't mean that, that they would have been convinced that it was Jesus' body, right? Because th they had their own private subjective experiences which and uh, all of that, things that they believe, which would have trumped anything that the enemies of Jesus would have been trying to, trying to put forward. Um, also, there's no reason to think that anyone had an interest in disproving claims about a few fringe weirdos uh, claiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. Um, now, I'm not even sure when the disciples started teaching publicly about the appearances. I'm pretty sure that was only after Pentecost, which was like weeks later. Um, I, I think that that's correct. But so the point is that it was only sometime later, we're talking weeks to months, where the disciples even started talking about this. And no reason to think that uh, the authorities would have cared about it until it started to become you know, a problem again. And initially, uh, it seems that their attitude was, you know, you cut off the head, kill Jesus, and that will solve the problem. The fact that none of the other disciples were arrested or seemed to have really been, I mean, I, I know they ran, right? But there doesn't really seem to have been any effort to like track them down or, or prosecute them, at, at least according to the accounts in the Gospels, if, if for whatever that's worth. So the point is, there's no evidence that the authorities cared uh, about any of these claims until later on when it started to become an issue again. But that wasn't immediate. Um, and furthermore, as I've argued in my book, the last thing the Romans would have wanted to do is stir up trouble again uh, shortly after Passover by dragging Jesus's body through the streets or what they claimed is Jesus's body through the streets. That would have caused a huge ruckus, which would have potentially led to a big civil uh, unrest. That's way more trouble. Best to just ignore it until it becomes 
you know, until later it became an issue, but that was only a long time later. So the point is there's so many problems with this digging up the body hypothesis here. We don't know that it didn't happen, um, but also it wouldn't have convinced anyone. So no one, prob presumably no one would have bothered. And even if they had, uh, it, it, even if they had bothered, it probably wouldn't have convinced the disciples anyway. And um, there's good reason to think that the Romans wouldn't have wanted to do it anyway, because it would have just caused more trouble than it was worth. So um, I just don't see... I just don't see why anyone would find that a convincing argument that, well, it, Jesus must have been resurrected because if it was a hallucination, someone would have checked. And even though we don't have any record of people like checking, the fact that they still believed it, even though hypothetically they could have checked, must have meant that they did check and didn't find anything. Like, well, what kind of reasoning is that? <laughs> it's just really bizarre. Um, the fact is, as far as we know, people either were disinterested in checking or did check and it didn't convince anyone. And that's completely consistent with what we see today. How many people believe that COVID-19 is fake? How many people believe that the last US presidential election was like stolen in a massive conspiracy theory? How many people believe that the earth is flat for goodness sake? Like there are so many ridiculous beliefs that people hold, some of which they even suffer for. Like people have gone to jail on the basis of Trump's claims that the election was stolen. People have died from COVID on the, on the basis of claims that, you know, uh, vaccines are invented by Vil Bill Gates to try to infect us with like the nanobots from the 5G, you know, the, the craziest stuff that people uh, have, have, have suffered for. Um, and we have to believe that the disciples were like hyper-rational Asians who would never have believed anything uh, unless they had verified it very carefully. By the way, this isn't even consistent with what the Gospels say. There's there, there's some uh, there's some accounts that say that the disciples were skeptical at some times, but there are other accounts which show them as being entirely um, uh, entirely naive. Like when Jesus comes to, um, uh, I think it's Peter and and uh, those four disciples, right? And I think Peter was one of them. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I'm not an expert here. And he just says, um, uh, and he just sort of says, you know, uh, come and I'll make you fishers of men. And then they leave his nets and follow him, right? Now, presumably they they knew who Jesus was, right? But it, it, they weren't his followers at that point. And he just, Jesus just kind of says, hey, come and follow me. Like, And they don't then subject him to a, according to the account, they don't subject him to a rigorous cross-examination or ask for um, eyewitness verified accounts of his miracles. They just follow him, right? So, like, it, it, is that really consistent with a super skeptical attitude? Anyway, so... This argument's about checking would have occurred and because they still believe, despite the fact that checking could have occurred, that therefore the checking must have been ver verified. This is entirely speculative. There's reasons to think that it wouldn't have happened. And it's entirely inconsistent with what we understand to be the psychology of these sorts of movements um, t today. So I just regard this argument as extremely unconvincing. Doug's approach to the resurrection is basically this. Your gut tells you that claims like somebody flew across the Grand Canyon unaided in front of 500 witnesses uh, is false. So... Uh, you know, therefore, you should follow your gut and apply the same judgment to the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. But here's what's wrong with Doug's approach. First, our gut is reliable, but it's not infallible. If I told you that in some parts of the world, fish fall from the sky like rain, your gut might think it was a joke until you look it up online to see that that's true. There's a natural explanation, but it does happen. Since our gut can't, feelings can be wrong, we need to use our brains to weigh all the evidence related to a controversial claim. Second, when we do that, we see that our gut rejects the examples that Doug gives because they have less evidence than the resurrection. The most obvious example against a case of a flying man would be the lack of flying man believer communities that could be traced back to sincere witnesses that founded them, which originally included outsiders who were converted. Well, hang on. So why, why is that the criteria that we're using? It's, this is another problem that apologists consistently uh, well, consistently exhibit, which is that the criteria that they use to assess the resurrection is very clearly just extracted directly from the resurrection. Just think about all the things that Trent said there, that it's a community that would trace back to the source uh, based on people who knew the person that were, um, what was the last thing he said? The most obvious example against a case of a flying man would be the lack of flying man believer communities that could be traced back to sincere yeah. witnesses, communities, that sincere founded witnesses them, which originally founded included a, outsiders who uh, were outsider converted. converted. Yeah, we have that for Christianity, one. but not the flying man. Yeah, yeah. So the, the point is that's the criteria that have just been lifted straight from Christianity. This is, um, it's not, as much of a problem here, because I know that Trent's just making a comparison to the flying man, right? But I think it's a little bit of a problem here, and it's a broader problem elsewhere in apologist case as well. If you're assessing something like the historical evidence for, well, any claim really, what you should do is establish on independent grounds the criteria that you're going to uh, use to assess the, the historical case, and then apply that to the case in question. Now, of course, because you already know what the case in question is, it's hard to do that in an unbiased way, which is why you should like you have to be really careful in establishing those criteria and really try to use references from outside of the 
particular dispute that you're looking at to establish that these are the correct criteria and how to interpret them and how to apply them and so forth. This is why criteriological accounts for the resurrection, I think, are, well, at least the ones I've seen, fundamentally flawed, because the criteria that they use are usually just gerrymandered to deliver their correct conclusion, or at least, I mean, I'm not even like consciously necessarily, but just sort of subconsciously um, or just through bias or whatever. Um, you have to be really careful to make sure you get the correct criteria. And I don't think the trend's doing that here. Um, and so, so that's one factor that uh, I would I would mention there. That there's many other things that you you want to consider, and I've already talked about some of them. Like uh, some of the things that I would look to about um, establish whether an account is credible are uh, how early uh, are, are the claims that we have of the account, and how well attested are the documents. Um, in the case of Christianity, they're poorly attested. Uh, all of the Gospels are anonymous. They're written decades afterwards. We don't know what evidence that they used. Paul's are best attested, but he doesn't really say very much about the resurrection appearances, other than that they happened pretty much. Um, so there's not a lot to go on there. And even he, Paul, wasn't actually an eyewitness to any of those things. Um, so so that's one factor that I would look at, which I don't think fits very well with uh, with Christianity. And by the way, at least, I mean, the whole point about the fl Doug's flying man is that he adjusts the case depending on what people accept or don't accept, right? So there's no like one canonical version necessarily. But at least under some versions of, of the flying man, Doug stipulates that, yeah, actually, we have accounts from the time, even I don't know, by the flyman or people who directly saw the flyman written like the day afterwards. So in some accounts, actually, by that criteria, the flyman exceeds what we have on Christianity by the uh, the providence and the timing uh, and the quality of the sources. So that's one factor that I would mention. Another one is, do we ex ha do we uh, see the things that we would expect if uh, the, the claimed event occurred? And I already talked about the fact that I don't think we see that because we don't see Jesus appearing to other people around the world. Um, and vindicating his his mission in that way. Um, so that's another factor that I would mention. Um, also, the fact that there is a community that's based around it, which is one criteria that Trent mentioned. I don't see how this is evidence for the um, uh, for the the claim being correct. So let's compare two cases here. Um, in one case, Jesus really did appear uh, to his to his followers, and that convinced them to you know keep following him and and teach his message. And you know we got Christianity out of that. The alternative explanation is that Jesus' disciples came to sincerely believe that Jesus appeared to them, and on that basis, they they taught his message and continued spreading the message, and Christianity grew out of that. Now, in both cases, we have a community that traces back to the early origins of that movement, to people who sincerely believed. So, so how does the fact that there's a traceable community distinguish between the, the explanations? It doesn't, right? So it's not a useful criteria. At least I don't, I don't see how it's a useful criteria. Pretty much every religion, well, okay, the historically grounded religions, and by that I mean I would exclude Hinduism, for example, which is not a historically grounded religion because there's no like founder of Hinduism, right? And it traces back into sort of prehistory. But uh, historical religions like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, uh, Mormonism would be another one, um, Sikhism. M most, re most religions are uh, like historical religions. Um, and all of those have the point is all of those have communities that trace back to particular people in particular places. Um, does that does that well? Not only does that not prove presumably that they're correct, but does that even really count in their favor? I, I don't see how it counts in their favor. Like pretty much every movement traces back to a community that originated that that belief. Um, and honestly, let's think about it the other way. Suppose that Christian belief didn't trace back to a single historical community. Actually, suppose that it it sort of popped up basically at the same time, as far as we can tell, independently in different parts of the world, that would be way stronger evidence in favor of a, a miraculous or a supernormal intervention uh, it, because a, a usual naturalistic um, psychosocial mechanisms can't explain that. So in fact, it seems this criteria counts against Trent's preferred explanation because the fact that it all traces back to a single historical community who knew a charismatic founder is much more consistent with the normal natural uh, way that these movements arise and is... Um, uh, and so that's what you would expect under these sorts of accounts, whereas under a resurrection account, well, again, it, it's so poorly specified that it could go either way. But at, at least at least uh, it, it, that's not what you would expect under a resurrection account. It, you don't seem to have clear expectations, but that is what you'd expect under a naturalistic account. So, um, so Trent's, I think, missing criteria here. Some of his criteria I don't think actually support his case. Um, and other criteria, such as that uh, hostile uh, witnesses being convinced, I don't even think is – why is that evidence of anything? I actually, I, I just don't see what the argument is that that is, um, th that that is evidence. I, I guess the argument would have to be that the psychosocial mechanisms that lead to belief development can't occur or exceedingly unlikely to occur in someone who was initially hostile to the belief. But what's the, what's the basis for that? Uh, in my book, I, I talk about some examples of unexpected conversions. Of course, those are just the ones I've been able to find out about. There's no real scholarly discipline that sort of collates these and documents them, so it's a bit hard to to sort of find well well accredited examples. But I mean, 
just what's the basis for saying that these psychosocial mechanisms can't work just as well in someone who was initially hostile? What about the hypothesis that uh, Paul uh, developed feelings of guilt um, about the people he was persecuting or just had some sort of mental illness or personality disposition that led him to that experience? I'm not saying I have evidence for that, by the way. But what I'm saying is, given all of the factors and the vicissitudes of human psychology, what's the claim that initially hostile people can't then come to believe on the basis of purely sort of normal interactions that they, it has to be some sort of miracle. I just, I just don't see the argument for that criteria at all. Um, and so uh, I think that these criteria are just jerry rigged uh, to appear favorable. So basically I don't think Trent presents all the criteria that I would include. Some of the criteria I don't think are useful at all, like the hostile witness one and others such as the tracing back to a, a single community, I actually think favor a psychosocial explanation or a naturalistic explanation over a resurrection explanation. Yeah. Moreover, we can dismiss freak occurrences because there's no cause capable of breaking the laws of nature in that instance to make someone fly across the Grand Canyon. And if Doug says, well, the flying man is a miracle, we can doubt that too, because God does miracles in order to communicate a great truth to humanity, and that's lacking in this case. How does Trent know that God performs miracles to communicate a great truth to humanity? Ah, so I mentioned this uh, at the start. I wasn't sure whether Trent made this exact claim, but he does. He says it here. So if the purpose of, of the resurrection, at, well, the resurrection and the resurrection appearances is to communicate a great truth to humanity, God seems to have done a really botched job of it because actually he only communicated that truth to a very tiny group of people in a very specific cultural community at one point in time. God seems to be really slacking on the job here. There's many other people around the world who could have used, I would think, this message about... I don't know, God's uh, God's sort of final and uh, equivocal, it's not, excuse me, not equivocal, uh, God's final and, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but God's final and uh, determinate act of salvation on behalf of mankind. Maybe the Japanese like could have used hearing about that, you know, just like Koreans or Chinese people, Central Asians, like Indians, um, people people living in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, that, like, but no, no, God didn't, God, God didn't want to reveal this important truth to these people, just the people who kind of already knew Jesus, which is exactly what we would expect to see under, under like normal psychosocial mechanisms. Um, yeah, I, I don't get that at all. How does that support, <laughs> how does that support a resurrection? Exactly what we would expect to see under normal psych psychosocial processes and not anything that would be uh, characteristic of, of a miraculous account. H how does the fact that, um, how is the fact that God wanted to communicate a truth to mankind supported by the flimsy, lame evidence that we have in comparison to what could have been, right? Think about what could have been, uh, the evidence that we have for, for the resurrection appearances. Uh, it just baffles me, and I don't understand how people can uh, people can contend that. Um, think about the Shroud of Turin, for example. Now, I, I don't know what Trent has to say about that, and it's not important here, but like, we could have the Shroud of Turin, right? We could have it so that it, it, it had a documented history right through the first century to the present, and it could carbon date to the first century, right? Uh, and maybe it could be mentioned in the Gospels. Like the, the Shroud of Turin, which some Christians already think is legitimate, could actually be like overwhelming evidence. Uh, I, I guess it would be hard to say that it's for the uh, resurrection, right? Because how do you know that a resurrection produces a Shroud of Turin? But the point I'm making here is that's just one example of the sort of evidence that we could have. And we could have a hundred of these. We could have a thousand of these types of evidence. Um, but I suppose you have to say, well, God can't make it too obvious, right? Because <laughs> then he's going to make it a bit easy, right? He's going to take away your free will by presenting powerful evidence. Even though defenders of libertarian free will typically say that there's a difference between what causes your actions and reasons that you take your actions for. So in fact, providing good reasons for acting in a certain way in no way compels you to act in a certain way because there's a difference between what causes your actions and reasons you act for. So I think that this is a fundamental confusion here, uh, that there's no way that God could take away your free will just by offering powerful reasons for you to act in a certain way. In fact, it's precisely by offering powerful reasons to act in a certain way uh, that a, a loving God should operate with respect to humankind by saying, by uh, exposing his reasons to us and saying, hey, here are all the good reasons you have for following me, both like moral reasons and epistemic reasons and so forth. Uh, so, you know, come and follow me, not just by like doing a half-assed job and sort of trying to hide himself under the shadow a little bit and like presenting just a little bit of evidence. Anyway, so I think philosophically that doesn't make sense. I'm not saying Trent made that argument because I don't think he does, but I'm just responding to that as something that's sometimes raised. The point is that the evidence for the resurrection is crap. If God really did want to use the uh, miracle as a, um, a message to mankind. So I think that it's completely inconsistent with what we'd expect to see there. Also, as I said before, how does Trent know that God wants to do that? I think I mean, a Christian would say, of course, that, uh, that, but aren't we supposed to be using the resurrection as evidence for Christianity? Um, 
so unless we already believe that God uses miracles to communicate to mankind, then I, I don't know how that's sort of going to work as a, as a chain in the argument. Like, well, I don't accept that. Maybe I'm a, a deist and I don't think God is in the business of using miracles to communicate to mankind because he, he just sets things up and lets it go. Or maybe I think that God uses uh, revelation to communicate to mankind, like through texts, but not like miracles. This is, I uh, want to be careful here, but Muslims typically say that, look, Muhammad did few or no miracles. Uh, there's the splitting of the moon, but but they say Muhammad didn't rely on miracles. His miracle was the Quran, right? Which was, uh, well, you know, God's miracle uh, manifest to, to mankind as a sort of a definitive revelation. Um, now, if you thought that way, then you might think, look, God doesn't communicate important messages to mankind by performing a miracle. He communicates important messages to mankind by communicating the message, <laughs> you know, as like a text. Uh, so there's just two other ways you could think about this, right? Even if you're a theist. Uh, so again, uh, that's a critical, remember I mentioned sort of uh, things that are asserted or implied without argument. This is another one of those, the idea that God communicates important messages to mankind through miracles. Where does that come from? How is that substantiated? And we need to substantiate this without appealing to Christian theology because we're, I mean, if this is supposed to be an argument for Christianity, then we can't just appeal to Christianity in order to uh, evidence it, right? So so that needs to be defended as well. Furthermore, how does Trent know that um, that God wasn't communicating important message to mankind through the flying man. Maybe it's a message that we've all missed, right? In our sin, we've just neglected to understand the importance of this message. Uh, but, but I mean, it could have been there, right? I, I don't understand what the argument is that God couldn't have used the flying man to communicate an important message. Uh, the argument just seems to be, well, no one actually thinks that the flying man did communicate a message. But so, so I mean, is, is that definitive? Like there has to be a, a certain number of people who believe um, that, that who believe in it in order for it to be, accepted but but that would seem to rule that early christianity because like hardly anyone believes in christianity at that time it was a tiny fringe movement uh so anyway uh, again trent hasn't argued that but i'm just responding to that because i have heard that sort of argument before that well it has to be sort of big enough in order for us to take it seriously as a potential revelation but i, I don't see why popularity would be um a sort of a uh, a guide to um a guide to truth here about what, what god wants to reveal to us anyway so a whole lot of problems with with this argument here uh, against the, the the flying man but even if Doug's hypothetical were exactly parallel to the resurrection, who cares? Doug's argument is like asking, you say it's irrational to eat moon rocks, but if the moon were made of cheese, would you eat it? To which I would say, if it were, I might, but it isn't, so I won't. Likewise, if there were a non-Christian miracle with the same evidence as the resurrection, I might believe in it, but there isn't, so I don't. And I Well, I, I think the point is a little stronger than than you might. It's it, I think what um, what Doug is trying to do with those thought experiments is to illustrate that at least many Christians are not actually intellectually consistent about this. Um, or that if they consult how the way they think about the flying man, they would realize that to be consistent, they should have similar, they should entertain similar doubts about the resurrection. So the point here is that I don't think it's enough for Trent to say that he might. Um, I mean, the claim here is not whether he would or would not believe in the flying man, given the same evidence, it's whether he should, right? But um, even making that caveat, I, I think that to entertain, sorry, to uh, to entertain the flying man sort of seriously you, you need to say a little more definitively as to whether you you think according to your current principles that you should believe the flying man in if the evidence was x y and z not just that well maybe like that that's not really an answer right so it, the point is that if we want to say that we would believe the flying man with evidence x y and z but not just with evidence x and y then we've established that z is the critical piece of evidence that tips over the threshold and i think that's one of the purposes that doug uses it for is to try to illustrate what or, or come to uh, come to work out what the key pieces of evidence are. So I just feel like Trent's not really engaging with that properly when he's just sort of saying, oh, maybe I believe. But like that kind of matters, right? We're trying to establish what the what the critical pieces of evidence would be, uh, or at least what you endorse that they should be. Whether or not you would actually believe in the case is, is somewhat different as to whether you would currently endorse that that's what you should think on, you know, on the basis of the evidence. Anyway, so um, but that that's sort of one point there. But the, the issue that um the flying man is just a hypothetical. Well, uh, I know Doug doesn't really talk about this, but I would advance that we actually do have comparable claims, not quite like the flying man, of course, but comparable claims of um, better, uh, equally or better evidenced claims of either a miracle or paranormal things, uh, like events occurring to groups. I document them in my book. I won't go through them now because it's not not really the time, and I do want to finish up soonish. Um, and I've got to leave something to my book where I can't can't share everything here. But there, there are actually lots of examples of this, depending on exactly what criteria you, you want to use. Um, I think Trent's going to talk about Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, I think, is one of the better parallels. Um, so I'll leave it to him maybe to talk about that.
And I know there isn't because if there were, Doug would just cite that miracle and ask why Christians don't believe in it and just ignore using hypotheticals entirely. No, that, so that's nonsense, right? Because what, what Doug is trying to do is he's trying to avoid getting bogged down into the details of what is or is not the case, right? And just sort of stipulate what is or is not the case in the hypothetical so as to identify which elements are critical and which are not, you know, for, for each person that's going to be different. So I think Trent's being un, being uncharitable here um, by sort of, I don't know, misunderstanding or not appreciating what the purpose of the hypothetical is. The purpose of the hypothetical is not to convince Christians that they shouldn't believe in the resurrection just because of the hypothetical. The point is to try to identify, at least as I understand the point of it, is to identify which elements um, of evidence uh, that the Christian does regard as being critical. And then uh, I guess there's a further objective there to potentially get them to see that the standards that they use to assess the fly man are inconsistent with the standards they use to assess the um, the resurrection, or at least for many Christians. Maybe not so that true for all, but but at least for many Christians, I think that Doug wants to draw out that, that inc inconsistency. Um, so whether or not Doug can go on to cite actual examples that are analogous to the flying man or the resurrection or whatever is, is immaterial for the purpose of the flying man. The, the purpose of the flying man is fundamentally epistemological. It's not to cite a comparative case and say that, well, this has happened. I mean, the existence of comparative miracle cases is, is itself not really relevant unless you want to use them for a specific argument. I appeal to comparative miracle cases because I think they establish the plausibility of the mechanisms that I uh, that I outline as responsible for the resurrection. The idea is, look, these mechanisms are broadly sufficient to account for these other uh, cases, uh, with, you know, with making the appropriate changes, of course, like the empty tomb is not going to be relevant in other cases, but you get the point. The same type of psychosocial mechanisms are going to be appealed to in these cases. Um, and that's the fact that those cases exist is evidence in, in favor of my contention that the psychosocial mechanisms can give rise to these sorts of beliefs in, in, in the relevant circumstances. Um, now, conversely, the Christian, at least I would argue, doesn't have any explanation for these other cases because the resurrection can only account for, well, the resurrection. Uh, perhaps they may accept some of them as as uh, legitimate miracles, but many of them are in uh, contexts that the Christian typically wouldn't uh, wouldn't accept uh, because of their commitments. And so the, the, the Christian then has to find a way of distinguishing uh, why they accept one miracle claim and not the other. And um, the argument is that, well, they can't do that essentially, or or it leads them to implausible, uh, implausible uh, claims or inconsistent claims. That is somewhat analogous to what Doug is doing, but uh, the difference is that one is appealing to like actual historical evidence and and linking that to a specific explanation or a specific case uh, about how we think the resurrection appearances uh, you know developed, uh, whereas the other is really just exploring the. Uh, you know, ex exploring the epistemology behind uh, behind what we could believe. So uh, the point is that they're different things. Appealing to case specific cases achieves a different purpose to exploring hypotheticals. And, and uh, conflating them in this way, I think, is is just confusing. It's it's a way to sort of tarnish the waters by making it seem like just Doug doesn't know what he's talking about, or Doug doesn't have anything better than hypotheticals. When hypotheticals don't serve the same purpose as real cases, that's sort of like saying, why do philosophers talk about trolley problems? Why don't they just look at real ethical dilemmas? <laughs> uh, with the fact that they talk about trolley problems must mean there are no real ethical dilemmas apparently well that, that's a ridiculous inference to make the point is that hypothetical serve a different purpose to real ethical dilemmas uh, just as like historical or miracle hypothetical serve a different purpose to citing real specific cases if anything doug's past reliance on hypotheticals like the flying man proves the unique evidential quality of the resurrection anthony flew who was one of the most famous atheists in the western world said that quote the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion it's outstandingly different in quality and quantity now, in some cases, Doug has offered real... Any quote from Anthony Flew that apologists make, I regard with a lot of skepticism because I know that last book that he wrote was in collaboration with uh, someone else. And there's some question as to how much of that was actually Anthony Flew. So I'm just going to leave that as a big question mark. But also Anthony Flew, from my, as far as I'm concerned, he could have said whatever. And that really has no bearing on anything because, you know, that's just some guy saying it, right? Like, unless there's some actual argument given, what relevance does this have? Real counterexamples. If you believe the disciples, he said, why don't you believe Joseph Smith and an angel gave him golden plates to make the Book of Mormon? First, even if the evidence were the same in both cases, a Christian could believe this event happened without accepting the truth of Mormonism. In Galatians 1.8, Paul tells his audience that, quote, if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. In that respect, Smith may have received a false gospel from a malevolent spirit, since it contradicts established divine revelation, like when it claims God is a man uh, who lives near a celestial body named Kolob. It also contradicts a Okay, so I, I'm glad that Trent does actually engage with the Mormonism case. Um, uh, 
But, I mean, there's a number of issues here. One, Mormonism does not claim that God is a man who lived, uh, what does he say, on or near? What does he say exactly? In that respect, Smith may have received a false gospel from a malevolent spirit, since it contradicts established divine revelation, like when it claims God is a man uh, who lives near a celestial body named Kolob. Yeah, Mormonism doesn't doesn't claim that. Um, it's sort of unclear exactly what Kolob is supposed to mean in, in Mormon theology, but it's it's not like God was like a dude who lived near there or something. Um, but also... Uh, where, where does it let's use the typical standard that apologists use about contradictions where does it say in the new testament that god doesn't live near kolob i don't think it mentions that in the new testament so how is that a contradiction where's where's the contradiction mormons don't think there's a contradiction <laughs> it all depends on your interpretation right so I, I think that these contradiction arguments are going to be um uh are just going to be wrought with problems about how you interpret things but putting that to the side uh, and of course by the way most Jews think that the New Testament is in conflict with the Old Testament, so we can play these games all day. Um, so that I don't think is a very convincing argument. Again, the question would be, I mean, how do how do Christians usually argue for the New Testament? They say, look, if Jesus was, was resurrected, that vindicates the New Testament. Even if it may seem at first glance to, to be a bit in tension with the Old Testament, you need to interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament, and then it makes sense. That is exactly what Mormons say. They say if uh, Jesus did appear to Joseph Smith, and he was a real prophet, then we need to interpret the New Testament through the lens of the um, the Book of Mormon and, and other uh, scriptures that Mormons have. And when done that way, it, it, it makes perfect sense, right? So it's exactly it's exactly the same argument that Christians make. So that alone cannot be used as an argument against the evidence for the um, uh, for the, the plausibility of like miracle claims to Joseph Smith. A, a Christian who is not a Mormon might appeal to that as their reason for rejecting it, right? But the point is, as outside observers who are adjudicating these miracle claims, that's not going to do, right? Because it's just presupposing a particular theology in order to uh, in order to adjudicate a point that is supposed to establish that theology in the first place. So that, that's not going to work for a, like a, a critical outsider. Um, but also the, the point that Trent made here is, I think, exceptionally problematic. In fact, it almost completely undermines his case, I would argue. I don't want to overstate it, but like I think it's hard to overstate this. Trent just said that um, uh, Joseph Smith could have experienced a, a vision or some sort of appearance by a malevolent spirit, um, presumably, which also could have, I don't know, brought him to gold plates or something. Um, okay, so if we're allowed to invoke malevolent spirits as potential explanations. I feel like I might need to whisper this. Maybe malevolent spirits appear to the disciples. Like I know that's sort of sacrilegious to say, but like somehow we're allowed to invoke malevolent spirits in other religious contexts, but not for the disciples. I mean, you could even say that malevolent spirits actually resurrected Jesus, but but I mean, maybe you don't want to go that far and say, well, God doesn't allow them to do that, right? The resurrection, that's a bit crazy, but appearance is right, but resurrection is too far. But okay, they don't even need to actually resurrect Jesus. All they need to do is appear to the disciples in a way that misled them into believing that Jesus actually did raise from the dead. So what source for the goose is source for the gander, to quote my friend Craig here. If it's okay to invoke an explanation of malevolent spirits as accounting for joseph smith appearances why shouldn't we also invoke that as accounting for the resurrection appearances and this is why i would say that even if naturalistic psychosocial accounts of the resurrection appearances fail there are still plenty of options on the table that don't um uh, uh, plenty of explanatory options on the table that i think are superior to the resurrection explanation such as malevolent spirits i think malevolent spirits are a better explanation because you can be used to explain a wide range of miraculous accounts basically we just sort of think that there are these sort of spirits that have powers to appear to people or or delude them or whatever and they just kind of get bored i don't know they have a weird sense of humor they like to cause mischief and so they appear to people and they do wacky stuff right especially when they see an opportunity they take it to, to mislead and delude people they did it with joseph smith they did it to muhammad and they did it with jesus's followers like i think that's a better explanation than what the christians have to say which doesn't account for as i said the, the fact that the evidence is actually pretty poor if we wanted if god wanted to reveal himself to mankind it doesn't really i haven't really mentioned this but it's also you have to reconcile it with the fact that um what christians teach about the messiah is completely different to what jews currently and have always taught about the messiah so you have to sort of find your way around that um and so i i think that this malevolent spirit's a better explanation i, I think it's I think the naturalistic explanations of sort of of the sort that I offer, the psychosocial explanations are even better than that. But I would go for malevolent spirits over a divine resurrection, at least absent further sort of sort of theore uh, theological arguments there. But then we can also appeal to uh, what about aliens? Maybe aliens um, either resurrected Jesus or made it appear that Jesus had resurrected because I don't know they were they were trying to reveal an important message to mankind, perhaps, or they they were just bored on their lunch break, or um, uh, it was a dare, you know. Um, 
just a prank bro gone wrong. Uh, maybe that's like alien TikTok where they posted it up to. Like, why is that a worse explanation than God raised Jesus from the dead to reveal an important truth that he only wanted to reveal to a particular you know group of people in, in a particular context? Why is aliens on their lunch break a worse explanation than that? I'd, I'd, I'd seriously like to discuss why that's a worse explanation. I don't think it's a good explanation, but I don't think it's a worse explanation than what the Christians have to offer. So the, the point is, if we're to uh, if we're to allow these sort of appeals to other supernatural type of explanations or malevolent spirits, I, I think that that's basically going to undercut a resurrection type explanation because it's going to be better. It's going to have greater explanatory power if we appeal to this broadly. Um, and I don't see how the, the Christian can, um, like what evidence can they appeal to um, in, in virtue of which it's better to, uh, the resurrection explanation is better than, than the, the demon explanation or the malevolent spirits explanation. But okay, so, so Trent does mention that, but he doesn't rely on that. So let's put that to the side now and see what else he has to say to distinguish the, the Mormonism case. It also contradicts historical facts, so we know it isn't divine. For example, even atheistic archaeologists can tell you where Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and even tiny villages like Nazareth existed and who lived there in the first century, even if they deny any miracles took place there. But nobody, Mormon and non-Mormon, can tell you where any of the alleged cities in the Book of Mormon are located. Estimates of the location of major cities the size of Jerusalem, like so-called so Zaramella, range from Central America to Southeast Iowa. The same is not true of the Bible. Since Christian and non-Christian scholars agree on many basic facts related to Jesus' death 2,000 years ago, whereas only Mormon scholars believe in facts related to what Jesus allegedly did in the Americas 1,600 years ago. In fact, when we look at the evidence for Christian and Mormon miracle claims, we see significant differences between them. Okay, so he's moving on to another point now. Um, I just think that, I, I mean, I agree with Trent that those are reasons to, I don't think those are sufficient reasons to reject Mormonism, but they count against it. Um, but they're not directly relevant for the miracle claim. Um, the miracle claim is that Joseph uh, Joseph had an experience of uh, God and Jesus appearing to him. And then later on, there's, a, there's accounts of uh, Joseph and uh, three of his associates experiencing um, an angel and, and the plates being shown to them. That's the three witnesses. And then later on, there's another experience with the eight witnesses experiencing the plates and touching them. Uh, so there's at least sort of three different experiences you can talk about there. And there's many other experiences that different people report at different times of seeing different angels and things uh, as, as part of the, uh, the early Mormon um, development of the church there. Uh, th these are what we need to account for. Saying that we don't know the location of various cities that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon, I, I just don't understand how that's relevant. Um, like, how does the fact that we don't know where these cities uh, existed, if they did exist, mean that Joseph Smith didn't see an angel? I, I just don't, I don't see the connection there. Um, I suppose, again, the, the way I would phrase it is that that casts doubt on the historicity of the Book of Mormon, which in turn casts doubt on whether it's genuine divine revelation. But that that doesn't, th that in itself doesn't tell you that Jesus, that, sorry, that Joseph didn't experience something, that, that it wasn't a miracle. Like that, it, that's, that's a, that's a big step there that Trent really doesn't try to, I mean, maybe there's something he can say there, but he, he doesn't really try to close that gap. But I feel like that that's mostly a red herring. Um, also, the fact that only Mormon scholars accept those, the claims about the, what the, you know, Book of Mormon archaeology, which, which is sort of broadly true. Um, I, I don't know what, whether Trent would ap apply the same, um, the same approach or the same criteria when appealing to, uh, claims about the authorship of the New Testament or, um, I don't know, miracles in the, the Catholic faith or um, other sorts of claims that are typically only accepted either by Catholics or only accepted by conservative evangelical scholars. So we want to be careful there about applying consistent standards. I'm not exactly sure, so I don't want to overstate the case here about what Trent would say there. But um, again, broadly speaking, apologists don't always use, in my experience, don't always use consistent standards here. When it suits them, they'll say that this position is fringe minority position. But when it doesn't suit them, they'll just invoke that fringe minority position anyway. So one, one should be cautious there. But again, this is all sort of a red herring, I think. What we should focus on is the miracle claims themselves and what the evidence is for them. Because if the, I mean, what Mormons say is, look, if the evidence for um, the the uh, Joseph Smith experiences and, and the, um, the miracle claims, uh, the appearances, if the evidence is good enough, then that just overcomes the fact that we don't have evidence for where the, you know, the cities in the Book of Mormon uh, are. That's in fact what many Christians say about aspects of the Bible and the Old Testament that they don't understand. So really, I think it's going to come down to, especially on Trent's logic, where individual, like unique historical events can um, uh, can, can overturn evidence for general trends. It's going to come down to the evidence for the, those um, miracle claims themselves. So let's hear what he has to say about that. For example, the eight witnesses to the golden plates, who were all friends and family of Smith, said they saw something that looked like golden plates. This could be a... They all were friends and family of Joseph Smith. Is that supposed to be a reason for thinking that they didn't experience 
a, uh, like that that they made it up or that it wasn't a real um, a real experience. Can anyone think of a reason why that is not a good criteria for, for trying to appeal to? Like, do I do I even need to say why that's not a good criteria to appeal to to distinguish the Joseph Smith case and the resurrection case? I think that I don't need to say why that's not not a good criteria. So let's move on. Okay, so friends and family not not going to be relevant here. Natural artifact. It may also be the case they only saw the plates under a cloth and said they saw them with spiritual eyes. Right. So they said they saw them with spiritual eyes. So we're not going to take their account at face value when they, I mean, we actually have a written signed account from the eight, well, from three and the eight witnesses. These are separate events. Um, plus there's Joseph Smith's uh, claims of his own private experiences, right? Um, so we have signed accounts that are dated to the time, signed witnesses. We know who they are as individuals, way better than anything we have for, uh, for the resurrection uh, miracles. Um, but so the issue here then is Trent says, well, Maybe they saw an artifact that was just purely natural that then then sort of saw with spiritual eyes. Well, I mean, yeah, they do talk about spiritual eyes, right? But th the point is that Trent is sort of reinterpreting their experience in a way that doesn't require it to be a miracle. I mean, I can just do the same thing with the reports I see in the Gospels. Um, I can reinterpret it in a way that, well, maybe their memory was biased here. Well, that's their way of describing it. Or, you know, when... Um, uh, you know, when Jesus said to have walked through the wall, maybe he didn't actually walk through the wall. Maybe they just uh, remembered later on that, well, how did he come into the room, right? And then they sort of uh, later developed this, this idea that he walked through the wall. You know, the point is, if you're going to reinterpret the words, you can you can say pretty much anything about, about what the experience was. Maybe not pretty much anything, but you, you have a lot of a leeway there. So again, I feel like that this is not a consistent standard here, that when it comes to what it says in the Gospels, we have to take that as... <laughs> Uh, forgive the pun, as gospel. Whereas if it says that in, you know, one of the three witness or the eight witness accounts, that's just kind of, well, you know, that's what they say, right? Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not sure how that sort of reinterpretation work is going to go. When it comes to Smith's testimony, we have evidence it was not sincere, given that Smith used his status as a prophet to acquire civil power and multiple wives, some of whom were only 14 years old. Also, Smith dying in... Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, so thanks, um, nowhere, man. Uh, so, so Trent's going to say that Paul wasn't a friend of family. Yeah, so that's that's true. Paul wasn't a friend of family of Jesus. You know what else Paul wasn't? <laughs> Paul wasn't a witness to the resurrected Jesus. <laughs> Paul doesn't even account what, uh, what give us an account as to what his experience was. I think he says that he, that he heard... Uh, that he heard and saw uh, Jesus, but, but he doesn't really say anything else uh, in terms of detail. The detail that we have comes from Acts, not from Paul. Um, so, I mean, this is the question, right? So Paul sees Jesus. How did he know it was Jesus? He'd never seen Jesus before. Now, I suppose you say, well, Jesus told him he was Jesus, right? But could, could, could Paul have just hallucinated seeing Jesus and then the hallucination of Jesus said that he was Jesus or could, could in fact a demonic spirit have said that he was Jesus the point is that whatever you want to say about Paul's conversion Paul is not a witness to the resurrection appearances in fact apologists including I think Trent from what he said earlier are usually very equivocal sorry well, I'm saying equivocal wrongly uh, they're very clear about this point the resurrection appearances stopped at Pentecost well Paul was well after that so it's like there's Pentecost and it stops oh yeah but there was Paul how does that work, right? They stopped or they didn't, right? It's not just that there's random exception of someone who never never saw Jesus. No, no, Paul is not a resurrection appearance. It it does not fit within the the timeline. It does not fit within the the context. It doesn't fit with the phenomenology um, in terms of like what the account was. It, it's it's a separate thing. It, it's not a resurrection appearance. Um, you, you might as well just say that other people who um, experienced uh, visions of angels or of, um, I think people experience visions of Joseph Smith appearing to them after he was martyred. I'd have to double check that. But you, the point is that I could just as well invoke people who experience various visions as part of their conversion to Mormonism from like years later and invoke them as, uh, as examples as well. Like, if that's the broad net we're going to cast in terms of what counts as a resurrection appearance. But when I talk about resurrection appearances, I don't count Paul because he's not a resurrection appearance. He's some guy from years later who had never met Jesus and apparently, I say apparently because we don't really have a clear account, apparently saw Jesus appear to him. But that's not a resurrection appearance. Um, but I mean, Jesus is supposed to already been taken up in heaven to heaven by this point. So like, uh, anyway, anyway, but yeah, I, I, I think it's good to, to sort of clarify that point because sometimes Paul gets sort of um, snuck in here. Um, sorry, I got a bit distracted by that comment. Let me just wind, rewind a bit. When it comes to Smith's testimony, we have evidence it was uh, yes. not sincere, given that Smith used his status as a prophet to acquire civil power and multiple wives, some of whom were only 14 years old. Also, Smith dying in a shootout in a county jail is nothing like the disciples being willing to die for their belief in Jesus. All right. So Smith. So why should we not believe Smith? Uh, OK, first of all, um, 
does it matter whether so, so so Smith could have been a scumbag, right? And it's still the case that the three witnesses and the eight witnesses had the experience. So how do you account for those? Those are the actual group experiences that we want to advocate as comparable to the resurrection experiences. So now Trent's just talking about Joseph Smith. Um, but but hang on, what about the three and the eight witnesses? We, we actually need to account for those. I think he's going to say a little bit more about the three witnesses in a moment. So but so uh, uh, at some level, I want to say it really doesn't matter what Joseph Smith was. The question is, how do you account for the miracle claims? That's really fundamentally what we're interested in here. But OK, let's talk a bit more about Smith. Smith used his status to acquire civil power. That is true. He was mayor of Nauvoo for a period of time um, later on. Um, did, did Christians never never acquire civil power? Um, now they were subject to persecution, but you know that was highly uh, that was highly uneven, and it really depended on the region. Uh, do we do we know much about the um, do we know much about the actual positions that that say the disciples, particularly the disciples, they're the ones who are relevant here. Do, do we know much about the positions that they held? Uh, would it be correct to say that someone like Paul was in a position of authority with respect to the early church, uh, given that he's sitting out epistles all over the place telling them what to do? It seems that he was in a position of authority, and maybe that's not quite civil authority, although. I don't know, the lines were kind of blurred back then. But the point is, to say, and what about Peter? Peter is supposed to be the first bishop of Rome, which is like, you know, uh, what, what do the Catholics talk about that? The rock that Jesus built his church on? Is that not a position of power? If we're going to say that someone's miracle claims are invalid or should be ignored because the people who made those claims went on to acquire positions of power, then shouldn't we be pretty suspicious at least of Paul and Peter? And we don't even know what happened to the other disciples because, uh, again, we don't have we don't have evidence either way. I don't think that criteria is really going to work. Plus, also, what's the basis of that criteria? I guess the argument has to be, well, they made up the experience because they wanted to acquire power, even though, like, Joseph Smith acquiring that position occurred it depends exactly how you start the start of his ministry. I think it was around like 1826, 27, they started going public with things. He became mayor of Nauvoo like 1839 or 40 or something. So we're talking over 10 years later. So I guess Joseph Smith was playing the real long con here about um, about the, um, at least the issue with, of um, civil power. If that, was, if that was his specific goal, he was like, he somehow foresaw that they were going to end up in Nauvoo and like try to establish themselves there and that he was going to become mayor. Like... It, whether or not you think Joseph Smith was to some extent fraudulent on, I don't think that that's really going to work as ev as as sufficient as evidence for why he must have been. Well, because eventually, like years later, in highly complicated circumstances uh, that he could never have foreseen, he was going to attain civil power. Like, I, I just don't understand how we're supposed to regard that as a plausible explanation of why he started talking about God and Jesus appearing to him uh, like decade or over a decade beforehand. That seems a real stretch to me. And if you're going to impugn those motives to Smith, why not do the same thing with respect to the early Christian, uh, to the early Christians who also acquired positions of power? Uh, at least some of them did, and we don't know what many of the others. So again, I, I think that there's an inconsistency of the standards appeal to here. Okay, but that's the authority one. Maybe we don't think that that's the best. But what about the multiple marriages? Smiths did have multiple wives, right? And we're pretty sure that the early disciples didn't have multiple wives. Um, again, I would say, how do you know they didn't? But I know that I'm going to be out on stretch there because certainly that wasn't normal in the context. But um, I mean, for, for what we know, they could have had tons of girlfriends and we wouldn't know anything about it, right? So I'm, I'm still suspicious of that. But I don't want to lean on that. I just want to say that, like, how do you actually know? Um, but what I do want to say that is make a similar argument about um, that I just made before. Uh, basically, the claim is that Joseph Smith started making up these stories because he wanted to marry lots of women, even though um, the... Actually, I will show this. I was not going to share it, but I think this might actually be helpful. To me, this is just a real stretch, right? That Joseph Smith was, again, whether you think that there were aspects of dishonesty there, that you think he just made up all of these initial accounts because of this long con of, of marrying lots of women. That I find extremely implausible. Um, and let me just show the time uh, the, the timeline here, uh, which has uh, for which there's a really nice... I'm having trouble with sharing today for some reason. Share screen, for which there's a nice little diagram on the Wikipedias. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Um, so this is, um, let me make that bigger. Yeah, so this is a, a diagram of the timeline of, of Smith's marriages. So here's his sort of legally recognized marriage to Emma Smith. Um, here's the age of, of Joseph Smith. Um, so so this happened, at a, his first marriage happened around the same time as, as he started sort of publicly preaching about this sort of thing, although he'd, he'd been talking about it sort of privately a little, a little before that as well. Um, so there's, there's one sort of questionable case here, uh, which is um, like we don't really know. Um, for those who are in, 
let me just show for those who are interested that's the case of fanny elga uh which is a weird case it's not even clear exactly whether they were married or not uh, but even that one is like what seven or eight years later and and most of the plural marriages that people talk about happened like 15 years afterwards during the time in Nauvoo so again I'm not claiming that Joseph Smith here was somehow uh, like a saint or anything like that. All I'm suggesting is that it is implausible to suggest that religious experiences that were discussed around this time were uh, that Joseph made them up on the basis of an expectation of like 15 years later, marrying a whole bunch of women and like maybe an equivocal one seven years later. That's a pretty implausible claim uh, in my view. Um, also, I mean, you can question these multiple marriages. Like many of the, many of them were with young women, but many of them were with older women as well. It's kind of a bit weird, actually. <laughs> I don't uh, the, the idea that he was like a, a hormone maniac. I, I don't know that that fully fits the evidence. Maybe there's a bit of that, but anyway, uh, I just want to suggest that the, the story is a little bit more complicated there. But but the, the basic point is that I don't think the timelines line up. The idea that you're going to start making up these claims, which Smith suffered a lot of persecution for uh, over the intervening years, because like 10, 15 years later, he gained a position of power and influence. Um, is that really the explanation we're going for? Plus this doesn't account for the three or eight witnesses either. This is just Joseph Smith's testimony. So I, I just don't find this very plausible. And it seems that again, you could make a similar argument. You could say, well, look at the position of authority and power that Paul got within the early Christian church and Peter. Um, what did they make up their stories because because of the position that they would eventually get there? I think that that's a bad explanation, but it seems that just it would just be as valid to attribute that motivation in that case as it would be to attribute the motivation in Joseph Smith's case. So I, I don't think that's a very good explanation. I think that you have to actually respond to the fact of the uh, the, the claimed appearances and not just write it all off as oh they made it up because they thought that they would um uh, that they would get something out of it like 10, 15 years later, despite all of the persecution that they experienced in the meantime which is very well documented in the case of Joseph Smith. Oh, and that reminds me, the claim that Joseph Smith's um, dying in a, in a shootout is not the same. It, well, let me, let me replay it back because I think civil power and multiple wives, some of okay. whom were only 14 years old. Also, Smith dying in a shootout in a county jail is nothing like the disciples being willing to die for their belief in Jesus. Finally, yeah, nothing like the disciples um, dying for their belief in Jesus. Well, th there's no actual evidence for this claim. We're just told that it's nothing like it. But I mean... Mormons describe it as martyrdom, um, and Christians describe that the, uh, the the disciples died of martyrdom. I mean, that, that seems like they're alike, right? <laughs> they seem to have both died in some part for their beliefs, right? I guess Trent's going to say, well, look, Joseph Smith was caught up in all these political disputes, and he was in prison at the time because of, I can't even remember, something about the failure of the bank, I think. And then this mob attacked, and he defended himself. So that's not really martyrdom, was it? I mean, that, that's just being caught up in a, in a, I don't know, gang violence or something. Um, okay. Let's apply that same criteria, that same standard to the deaths of the apostles. What do we know about those? Well, the answer is effectively nothing. Um, we know what later tradition has to say about them. Um, and that tradition comes from essentially Christian sources. So I, I don't think that there's really anything unbiased that, that we can say historically about how the disciples died. So how do we know they didn't die in the first century equivalent of um, a gang shootout, if, if we sort of want to characterize it that way? Again, there's just an, again, the, the, the sort of claim I've been making uh, throughout is don't let these explicit or implicit assertions go without being substantiated. What is the evidence uh, that Trent can provide that the disciples of Jesus died in more genuinely martyred ish ways than Joseph Smith died? I claim there is no such evidence, and that's just an assumption on the Christian's part. Um, and furthermore, that it's not really clear that. It, it's very hard to establish that someone died specifically because they refused to renounce a belief. Like in the case of Joseph Smith, it's not like that the mob would have stopped attacking him if he'd said, oh, actually, guys, I made it all up. <laughs> uh, how would that in any way have helped his, his situation? Likewise, if the early Christians were being subject to persecution, it's really unclear how saying, oh, actually, you know what? I made it up. Um, or, well, maybe I just got it wrong somehow. It, it, it's unclear how those would have helped their situation. Um it certainly wouldn't have helped in the case of persecution by Jews because saying that you blasphemed and then actually saying, well, I got it wrong. Uh, like you're still supposed to be stoned. So I don't, I don't really see how that helps. Um, and in the case of the Romans, well, unless you're willing to make the sacrifices, uh, they're not really going to care about what specific uh, th th uh, theological position you espouse. And also th this sort of assumes that they're, that the persecution is not based on sort of political upheaval. So if, if basically you're a troublemaker, I don't think the Romans would have cared so much if you said, well, actually, you know, I, I kind of just made up the whole Jesus thing. The point is, if you're still a troublemaker, then then they are still likely to, uh, especially under Nero, which is, you know, uh, it was um, uh, 
uh, under Nero's um, sort of deranged persecution of the Christians uh, that that um, at blaming them for the fire of Rome that um, Peter was supposedly killed. Like in that situation, do you think that they would have let they would have let Peter off if this is even what happened? I don't think we know that, but if this is what happened, would they have let Peter off if he was just like, actually, guys, you know what? <laughs> I should have should have said this earlier, but uh, it turns out that you know. Uh, so the, the point I'm making here is that. It's very difficult to establish whether someone has truly died because of, like, in defense of a specific belief. And if we're going to push hard on that, like you may, maybe Trent's doing here with Joseph Smith, one should equally push hard on that with respect to the disciples. And I think that they're just there's nowhere like the evidence required to establish that in the case of the disciples. So if we're going to be fair and apply the same standard, I think we would say that Joseph Smith died for his beliefs as a martyr, just uh, to the same extent, as far as we know, that any of the uh, Christian disciples died. Um, especially if we consider the fact that we really should, the fair comparison would be to compare not everything we know about Joseph Smith, but only things we can know about Joseph Smith from official Mormon sources, because that's essentially what we have in the case of early Christianity. We don't have hostile sources or unbiased sources from those times um, about almost everything. There are a few references to the Christians, but for the most part, any detail that we know about you know what they said and did and so forth and what they believed, it, it, it really just comes from Christian early Christian sources. Um, and so obviously that's going to paint a different light to if you could have read the Roman account of like the details of these sorts of things, like exactly why Peter was killed, for example, if again, the, the Romans didn't actually kill Peter. I imagine that would say rather different things to what the, the Christian version of that says. So we have to also factor in that we're looking at a biased version of history when we're, when we're comparing the Christian to the Mormon, because we have a lot of evidence in the Mormon case that we just don't have in the case of the Christian case. Failing to factor that in is really going to do a disservice to our uh, sort of, um, objective analysis of the claims here. Finally, when it comes to the three witnesses, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris, we have reason to doubt their claim they saw an angel together show them the golden plates in a group setting. What's weird about this incident is that Smith had the plates in his possession because he was allegedly translating them, but he refused to show them to the men. Instead, Smith brought them to a wooded area and told them to pray very hard to see the golden plates. This probably primed the men to imagine a vision of an angel. But there were no such expectations when it came to Jesus' resurrection, and the Gospels record the apostles initially not believing the women. And while there is no, what do we hang on? So, so Trent has decided that there was an expectation in the case of the three, dis, uh, sorry, the, the the appearance to the three, the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, but has also just sort of decided that there wasn't such an expectation in the case of the disciples. How has that been established? If the three witnesses could be primed by Joseph Smith telling him to pray to see the gold plates, why couldn't the disciples have been primed to see Jesus appearing them to them when, I don't know, Mary or Peter or whoever uh, initially told them, hey, uh, I saw Jesus appear to me. Oh, and by the way, the tomb is empty. Well, that, that's just my argument, that, that that primed them to have that experience. Why can we say that in one case, but not the other case? I, I, I legitimately don't understand how you can just say that it didn't happen in one case, but oh, it probably happened in the other case. I, I, I see that as directly analogous here. No evidence showing the resurrection appearances were only subjective visions. Sorry, I feel like there was something else he said that I missed. I'm just going to replay Of that. an angel. But there were no such expectations when it came to Jesus' resurrection. And the Gospels record the apostles initially not believing the women. Oh, right, yeah. So the, 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 they record the disciples initially not uh, believing the women. Yeah, well, again, do we accept everything the Gospels say? I, I certainly don't. Um, and, I mean, there, plenty of Smith's early followers were skeptical about his claims as well. There's a lot of uh, a lot of evidence of that. Um uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that we need to get into all that. Uh, I, in my book, I talk about the motif of avowals of prior skepticism as a very common literary motif that's used to try to um, uh, basically increase the evidential impact of, of claimed experiences. So it's extremely common when people experiences, experience, and oh, sorry, it's extremely common when people report uh, unusual events. They'll say, at first I was skeptical or at first I doubted, but then I had this experience and that convinced me. Um, I provide some citations of that. Um, that's a literary motif. I don't see why we should actually take that seriously. But also, if we're going to apply that criteria, many of, of Smith's early followers were skeptical about him as well. There was the case where Joseph Smith was, oh, I think it was Martin Harris, uh, some Mormon aficionado can correct me if I'm wrong there. He, he was skeptical about whether he should fund Joseph Smith's translation. And so he he stole, um, or no, sorry, not stole. He, he got some of the he got some of the characters that Joseph Smith read and, and took them to with some um, I, I don't remember, some expert in ancient languages to have them checked out. Uh, th there's some issues about the details of exactly that story. But the, the, the point was that it's one little example that I recall illustrates that people that Joseph um, 
uh, that the Joseph encounter and were later his big supporters were skeptical at various points. So um, you could make the same argument with respect to his his followers. Again, we have to be careful if we're going to apply a criteria. We have to be sure that we apply it carefully. If the disciple, if we have evidence that disciples were skeptical, do we have similar evidence that J Joseph Smith's followers were skeptical? Because if we do, then we can't use that as a, a distinguishing criteria. Um, in fact, I think that there's better evidence that Joseph Smith followers were skeptical because we have documented things of them actually doing that are consistent with skeptics, whereas all we have in the case of the, the Gospels is what I would regard as literary motifs that just sort of say they were skeptical, but, but we don't really substantiate that. But anyway, um, so I, I don't think that's a very strong point. And while there is no evidence showing the resurrection appearances were only subjective visions, there is evidence, as Mormon author Marvin Hill says, that, quote, the three witnesses saw the plates in vision only. One of the witnesses, Martin Harris, later said, I did not see them as I do that pencil case, yet I saw them with the eye of faith. Finally, these men all temporarily abandoned Mormonism. This stands in contrast to the resurrection since there is no report of the disciples abandoning the church. Oh, we've got an argument from silence there. Remember, arguments from silence are okay, except when they're not, or they're not okay except when they are. Um, so Trent argued against an argument from silence with respect to evidence about the resurrection like from from non-christian sources but now we've had one invoked to say that none of the disciples left the faith what is trent's evidence that none of the disciples left the faith well his evidence is simply that we don't have any reports of them leaving the faith. Well, we also don't have any reports of most from most of the disciples really at all after the initial period um what happened to them we don't know it's lost to history we don't have reliable um evidence for, for all we know half of them could have apostatized like we literally have no idea um so again, if that's going to be the criteria, I don't think that's going to work here because we don't have the evidence on uh, on what happened to most of the disciples. But also the fact that all three of the three witnesses um, at least temporarily left the church, but still maintained their testimony about what they'd experienced. They said, yes, I experienced this thing, but I, for, for whatever reasons, they had the differences with Smith. Mormons use that as positive evidence for the veracity of the testimonies because if it was all some sort of conspiracy, you'd think that they would have mentioned that fact when they, I think I think one of them went back, but but two of them never did, uh, never did return to the, like the main Mormon church. Um, but at no point did they like publicly go out and deny their experiences. So Mormons use that as positive evidence. And in fact, we don't have anything... Um, we, that you, you could just as well argue this the reverse way that Trent is saying. You could say that, look, the fact that none of the disciples, at least we don't have any records of any of the disciples uh, disavowing Jesus but affirming their experience, um, actually weakens the case, right? Because if someone disavows the, um, uh, the, the leader, then that means that effectively they're hostile after the fact, which is actually really strong, right? Because that kind of rules out uh, or at least seems to un undermine arguments for like collusion um, or, or wishful thinking or things like that. Um, and so if you have someone who maintains that the experience happened, but but parts ways with the founder or with the organization or so on, that's really strong evidence that they had a real genuine experience. And you don't have that for early Christianity, um, at least as far as you know. Again, I'm saying we don't know either way, but 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 Trent would say, no, all of them stayed, right? So but the I mean, the Mormons obviously accept the resurrection of Jesus, but I'm sort of comparing them here, right? So, so the point is that you could say uh, as a Mormon apologist, well, actually the case is better here because we've got people who disavowed Smith, like they, they broke with him and they had disagreements with him, but they did not um, refute their, um, their, their testimonies of the experience that they had. So again, we've got to be careful about the criteria we apply here. And I would argue that this particular one actually favors the Mormon case over, uh, over the, um, the Jesus case. And I think that the broader point here is have we actually thought about this criteria? Have we thought about which way that they sort of swing the evidential pendulum? Uh, you, it's easy enough to just sort of say something as if, well, none of the disciples um, ever, ever um, uh, repudiated Christianity, like they all, they all suck with it. Yeah, but does that actually support, support the claim? I, I, again, I, I would argue that if some of them did, but still maintain, again, if they said, look, uh, I don't necessarily agree with the way the church is going, but I still maintain that I had that experience of Jesus, like th that would be stronger. Uh, that would be stronger evidence, I think. Maybe you don't believe God exists, though, so you don't think there's anything capable of raising Jesus from the dead. Well, let me offer an argument for the existence of God for you to consider. Here's an Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to respond to this point. I don't really know why it's in here. It seems really out of place. But um, I'm just going to comment on the, the, the typical tactic that's used, which is to say that, well, look, the main reason that people have for rejecting the resurrection is a naturalistic bias or a belief that God doesn't exist. And that's just nonsense, right? Um, you can believe in God every day of the week and vociferously strongly believe that he would never raise Jesus from the dead. Uh, in fact, there's a group of people who we can identify and have a long historical tradition of more or less <laughs> uh, 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 advocating this position. They're called Jews, right? Um, well, actually, Muslims would fit in the category as well, but I think Jews are an even better example because um, 
the, the evidence for Jesus' Jesus's resurrection was so compelling to first century Jews, those who were most familiar with the context and uh, like theological context, historical context, that almost none of them, okay, that's maybe a bit strong, but very few of them are, were actually convinced. Um, this, I think, is not what you would expect if God was revealing himself and revealing an important truth to mankind, that he would only succeed in convincing like uh, at least in the long term, those who were like less familiar with the context of it, those who were like most familiar would be failed to convince. Like, is that really what you'd expect? I suppose you could come up with a reason, but it seems pretty uh, implausible to me. But anyway, the point is that theistic Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Sikhs, um, all of these other religious traditions, for the most part, I mean, some of them are, you know, maybe a bit more... Um, not all these traditions are, are like exclusivists, but for the most part, people from these traditions do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, or they certainly don't uh, interpret that event in the same way that, that Trent does at the very least. Um, and they don't believe in God. And, and many of them believe that God does miracles, right? So what does belief in God have anything to do? Obviously, it's necessary that God exists if God raised Jesus from the dead. So it's necessary. I'll grant you that. But it's very far from sufficient. And it's not even clear how much it changes the probability because it seems that God has a very strong disposition to not resurrect people. <laughs> uh, there seem to be only maybe one case where he's done that. Maybe there's, I don't know, there's a couple of others some people point to as, as equivocal cases in the New Testament maybe, but it, at least it seems very rare that he does it. Now, there are some Christian apologists who will appeal to Monday resurrections, but of course we could look at the evidence for those and I think it's also very weak. Uh, but unless you're going to appeal to those, it, it seems pretty pretty clear that, that God has a very strong disposition to not resurrect people. Um, even if you want to restrict it to Messiah claimants, most of them aren't resurrected either. So why exactly is the existence of God really that relevant here, other than as a very basic sort of necessary uh, prerequisite? So what we really want to establish is that God would have a reason to, or would be in the business of resurrecting Jesus. And so for that, you'd want to give some sort of explanation for why he's doing it. And the problem is that, of course, Christians do have an explanation for why God raised Jesus from the dead. In fact, it's one of the things they like talking about most of all. But the thing is that, that theory only came up, uh, came about after the resurrection claims. It would be much more convincing, at least to me, if the, well, it depends on, it depends exactly how it went, right? But at least plausibly, if the claims about resurrection appearances occurred very, uh, very well in advance of uh, the resurrection actually occurring. And then, and this is the other aspect to it, and then there were aspects of the resurrection appearances or the way that that all occurred, which plausibly were not something that someone could have engineered to occur that way. Um, then that, that would be much stronger evidence, right? Because there's, I mean, basically that's sort of fulfilled prophecy, right? If there's some aspects that were predicted beforehand, at least in general terms, uh, that then came about afterwards, uh, that's much more convincing than no one has any idea about this idea of the Messiah is going to be resurrected to, you know, atone for our sins. And then that only is, that theology only is developed after the fact as a post hoc explanation of why the Messiah died, which wasn't expected. To me, that's actually a really weak source and strikes as just an attempt to rationalize why the disciples were not actually following the wrong Messiah. Now, there are there are counters that have been given to that, but at the end of the day, I think that it's sort of a problem either way. Un unless you can establish that there were essentially um, predictions or, or at least general statements made beforehand, which, which were outside of someone's control to influence later, or at least substantially influence later, um, and, and maybe there, there could be some such things you could imagine. Like there could be very specific predictions about, uh, you know, that the Messiah would, um, you know, re return on a cloud from heaven and that they, he would be witnessed across Jerusalem or something like that. You know, something like that's pretty pretty hard to to um, for someone to engineer. So if there was a, something like that in the Old Testament, which was unequivocal and Jews generally agreed with that, that would be much more convincing than what we actually do have, which is, uh, which is, mentions of jesus in the old testament that are only accepted after the fact like no one talked about it beforehand and only by christians um that's not really very convincing compared to what god could have done but uh, i was going to say that it, it's sort of it's problematic either way right because if you think that there's strong um there's strong reasons in the old testament for thinking that it's plausible that god would raise jesus from the dead uh to you know return for our sins and so forth well, then you've got the problem that that provides a very good explanation for why the disciples came to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, because it was obvious, like they read the Old Testament and they like, well, yeah, clearly that's what that's what it says, right? That's going to happen. So that that is much more consistent with the psychosocial theory, which says that entirely ordinary, like psychological and sociological causes are at work here, that they read about in the Old Testament and they came to believe that that was what was happening to them. On the other hand, let's suppose that the Old Testament really doesn't say much of anything about it, or the mentions are only equivocal and sort of unclear. Well, in that case, um, 
it seems really unlikely that God actually did want to raise Jesus from the dead. Again, the claim is that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. That's what Christians believe. How plausible is that on the basis of what it says about the Jewish Messiah in the Old Testament? Jews have said and continue to say that it's just not plausible. There are plenty of prophecies that Jesus didn't fulfill. Uh, the Messiah is not supposed to die. He's supposed to, um, you know, restore the, the the kingdom of Israel and, um, you know, unify the Jews and and become a sort of an earthly ruler and all that. Um, and there's no talk about the Messiah being like God incarnate. And there's no talk about him dying for our sins. Like, where does any of this come from? That That's not part of it. So if we are in the position of accepting the Old Testament and asking ourselves, was Jesus the Jewish Messiah? It seems that we have to say that it's very implausible that he would be because he doesn't fit the bill at all. It's, it's grossly inconsistent with um, with the portrait presented in the Old Testament. So I think that there's a dilemma here. Either you say you just accept the fact that on the basis of the Old Testament evidence and the beliefs as they were at the time, it's really implausible that God would have raised Jesus from the dead, uh, given that like it's really implausible that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah who was then raised from the dead. Or alternatively, you say, actually, it was very plausible, um, given uh, what was understood at the time about uh, what it says in the Old Testament, but then accept the fact that it follows that the disciples was, would have then been very likely to form that belief, p- even if it wasn't true, purely on the basis of exegesis of the Old Testament. So um, neither of those results, I think, is very favorable for, uh, for for the Christian argument that the resurrection was, it's both plausible, but also um, it was so unexpected that it had to be a real resurrection for the disciples to believe in it. So this is what they simultaneously must argue. It has a high enough prior for it to be a good explanation for us, but also it was so implausible to the disciples that it would have taken a real actual living, breathing uh, resurrected Jesus to have convinced the disciples <laughs> that a resurrection actually occurred. And I think it's just really hard to square that circle to say that it's plausible to uh, it's plausible to us and like, I, 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 I don't know, a, a hypothetical objective Jew observer of the Old Testament, but really implausible to the disciples in their position. I don't get that at all. Um, that seems really unlikely to me. So that, that's why I would say that even if you believe in God, even if you believe that God does miracles, and heck, even if you believe in Yahweh of the Old Testament, you still shouldn't believe on the basis of the historical evidence that Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, because it's a really bad explanation because it doesn't, it's not consistent with what the Old Testament teaches. Anyway, so I was going to potentially look at some of Trent's responses, but I actually think I probably covered most of what I wanted to anyway. Um, uh, the, the other interesting thing is when when Trent asks for some examples of um, m- certain types of miracle claims, and I think that basically what I would be saying anyway is just refer to my book. So I'll just do that now <laughs> and save us some time. Uh, as usual, the streams run a bit longer than I'd anticipated. Um, so yeah, I think that will conclude my remarks. I, I think overall... Although I think Trent did a much better job at presenting the argument than most apologists do, because he did look at things like Joseph Smith. He did he did um, consider um, some of the um, psychological evidence about bereavement hallucinations, for example, and that's things you often don't don't don't, don't even hear acknowledged. So I, I'd say it's a step forward. I'd, I'd rank it up there in terms of the quality of presentations, but I still think the arguments aren't very good. Um, and a major issue here, I think, consistent themes you saw are explicit or implicit claims that are just not evidenced um often about like what what the disciples did or what they believed or what they died for and things like this right um or you know whether the romans would have dug up jesus and things like this right so that's that's a big factor there claims that are just not evidenced is i think quite common another thing is inconsistent standards so a certain standard will be used to evaluate joseph smith's resurrection appearance sorry resurrection joseph smith's miracle claims uh, but a different standard will be used often sort of tacitly to evaluate the um, resurrection appearances in the gospels um or a certain standard will be used and uh, you know for, for the, the the naturalist has to provide uh has to cite cases in the past that are similar to the what they allege happened in the case of jesus but the the resurrection proponent doesn't have to cite similar cases because it's sufficient just to have one case to to sort of uh, contravene a general trend right so so these are some examples we saw of i think inconsistent standards being applied um and um i think a final a final thing uh, a final aspect that we saw here is um just an unwillingness to, well, maybe unwillingness is a bit unfair, but I would say um, a wrong view of human psychology would be the way I would put it. Basically to see humans as highly motivated um, to believe things that make themselves feel good or to to understand, at least to make sense of their experience. Feel good is maybe a bit of a too broad term, but like to come to, to help them come to grips with their experience uh, and, and that memory is biased and often uh, misleading especially in these sorts of, you know, highly charged religious contexts and that um, delusory, ex- uh, delusory beliefs are actually, so delusory experiences are quite common. 
Um, irrational belief persistence is common and well documented. And when you combine all these things together and and also think about things as a process um, of development and not as just sort of uh, the beliefs of, of resurrection appearances just sort of coming from nowhere. If you think if you take these things seriously and think about the process by which these sort of could have chained individual bereavement hallucinations, uh, you know, leading to group experiences, which then become more impressive in the retelling and in the recollection, and then they discuss with each other and then, and then so on. As I discussed in my book, if you take that seriously, I think that the, the um, sort of broad psychosocial explanation for the resurrection appearances becomes a lot more plausible than Trent paints it here. So um, th those are some of my sort of meta, meta objections. I don't think the resurrection uh, is a, um, I, I think it's rational for Christians to believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead if they kind of already have theological commitments to that effect. I don't think it's rational to believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead on the basis of sort of historical slash sort of general philosophical considerations alone. So in other words, a, someone who was just sort of a um, an unbiased general sort of skeptical observer faced with this evidence, I don't think would be convinced or should be convinced uh, that Jesus raised from the dead. And in fact, I think that that is actually, funnily enough, what we observe is that very few people who are not already Christians, already kind of leaning towards Christianity, uh, are convinced by this sort of evidence. Um, of course, you know, that in itself is not definitive, but I think I'm just saying that I think that that's actually consistent with what we would uh, what we would expect. Um, so let me just, before finishing out, see if there's any final comments uh, that I wanted to um, react to. Thanks for those who participated in the stream i think someone panda products here when will you correct your video on inspiring philosophy um yeah so i think this is referring to the fact that i <laughs> yeah so ip pointed this out i confused the legate gag inequalities with legate inequalities i think that this was so i actually did do a video on this um i did a video where i uh, which was titled like inspiring philosophy misrepresents science. And then I did a follow up to his blog post responding to that called inspiring philosophy still misrepresents science where I talk about that. Um, and the fact that I was unclear as to which of these legend inequalities IP was referring to actually really has no bearing on anything really. Um, but if you're interested, you can check out that video on that. Um, welcome Rebecca. Good to see you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I well, <laughs> it is a good video for Holy Week or a good topic for Holy Week. That's one of the reasons I chose it. All right, thanks, everyone. I'm going to end up the stream now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully you found this interesting. Stay safe. I'll talk to you next time.